Hey everybody, welcome back to Terminus, uh, the NPR's fresh air of extreme metal podcasts. I am the death metal guy, a.k.a. Anthony Fantano, committing a mass shooting in full Joker cosplay. And I am the black metal guy, a.k.a. Vince Nail staying at a Marduk show. Anyway. Do you think uh, he's ever been to one? Probably. That's the thing, right? These all these people have 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 been to those things, right? And then and yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, they're the ones who no, get I mean, press access. If you want to, if if you want, right? If you want to play that game, right? All of these all of these people have all been to all sorts of naughty things for years, right? Um, before <laughs> they decided, before they decided, they'd make a business out of uh, out of tut tutting at everyone. Man, um, I, I just when do how many episodes do we have to do before we get press passes and don't have to like pay for shows anymore? Dude, shit, we should get the uh, we, yeah, we should cut. <laughs> yeah, we we could do um, uh, never surrender fest or something, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, Berlin. I don't, I don't even know, like. It's, uh, God, I, I mean, I, honestly, the lineup's pretty good this year, you know. Uh, I haven't. And seen WN it. is kind. Of, yeah, it's um. I think, uh, but the problem is, any show that I would want to go to, the Horn is playing. Oh, okay, Horn is pretty good. I've seen them yeah, once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. they're pretty. Anyway, what were you gonna say? Oh no, I was just gonna say, you know, any show that I would want to go to, for the most part, I could probably get into for free anyway, <laughs> just because I like know the people at the local bars and shit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, I guess I'm for the show, yeah. All right, cool guy. Um, oh, I apologize right, so... that I leave the house, or I used to leave the house before the plague <laughs> started, you know. So, uh, yeah, yeah for we, sure, man. we've got some housekeeping to do. Let's do that real quick. Yeah, housekeeping. So, um, looks like we got a big bump in our listenership uh, on, on the last episode. Uh, so, to anyone who's new, uh, welcome back. We uh, hope you stick around. Uh, tenth and, episode. Uh, that's the tenth. Like that's got to be yeah. like like crossing the, the one year one mark. Out. Crossing the one year mark for a restaurant. If we can get to ten episodes, mm-hmm. that I feel like that's the podcast equivalent. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we've I think we've begun to prove that we can you know generate content. So I think in, you know yeah. And in a couple episodes, we're going to start rolling out some more shit. Uh, but um, I wanted to say thanks to uh, nihilistic noise propaganda. Uh, to Nidstang Productions, both of whom we covered last time, and to uh, Nathan T. Burke, uh, the sort of from Zero Tolerance, who's also just become the go-to guy for promos for many of the. If it's like a good, if it's a good label that does promos, there's like a seventy-five percent chance he does it. Um, and I think all of these people helped uh, give us a give give us a signal boost after the last episode. So thanks, dudes. Uh, we're also trying to. Uh, you know, network a little more, branch out, build some, uh, build some inter-platform connectivity. Uh, so, um, <laughs> we're, so, we're so utilizing to... all of our, our potential avenues of income. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People don't say, people don't say synergize anymore. Um, but, uh, we've got, we've got new, new versions of that. Yeah. We want to disrupt the, uh, disrupt the market space. We are disrupting uh, the metal but, market space. <laughs> that's true. That is the goal. Um, but, uh, so, we, we sort of shouted out Greg Beal, who has this great YouTube channel last time. It turns out uh, some people got us in touch with him, and they told us he was actually the first vocalist of Nunslaughter, and his stage name was Gregoroth. So uh, <laughs> we're going to link to his we I've, we're going to link to his channel in a, a support column on the YouTube page. Also going to link to a great channel uh, called Bool God B O U L space G O D, uh, and. Uh, it's similar kind of stuff to Greg Beals. It's lots of underground releases. Uh, Bull God has some sort of specific curatorial taste that is like this invisible common thread running between all these things. And all his albums also have cool covers. Um, the most so, important uh, thing. Yeah, these are... Yeah, he's he's the first person who posted the Oppressive Descent album we reviewed a couple weeks ago. I gotcha. Ago. Uh, yeah, so, um, so these are solid channels. You know, if you've got a... Uh, and I suppose, hey, if you've got a cool YouTube channel or a band you want us to check out or something, get in touch. Email us the uh, the true terminus at gmail dot com. Um, all right, so is that it? Up to is date, we've got. I, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, I mean, we'll do some. I'll, I'll do some 
you know, like and subscribe, Horan, after the first. Oh, we did. Hour we did have a, a very nice review on Apple Podcasts. We should. Our oh, first I forgot one. that guy. Shit. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> that was the most important <laughs> one too. Uh, it's a. Uh, yeah, we got we got our uh, our first our first review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, give five us five stars. stars. Really five fucking stars. <laughs> five fucking stars and a really uh really nice thoughtful review by a guy named Damian Vetter. Uh, and um, seems like a black metal guy. So thanks, Damien. Um, and uh, we're glad you're enjoying the show. Not anyway, uh, today we've got four bands that... I think four albums that we, we really like all of them. Yeah, no, this which, is a really which, good show. It today. might be a first. Uh, I it think there's be been first. like one other where we had like everything was just like really good. But yeah, no. we And it's all black metal today, too. Yeah, and it's um yeah we went for an all black metal episode and it's a little I would say what one thing that one common thread is that it's all uh not quite normal black metal but it's all sort of classic in its own way there are all these kinds of people doing things in classic traditions that are a little bit marginal to say Norwegian second yeah, wave it's... or the current melodic French sound or whatever Cl- classic traditions mm-hmm. just ones you might not have heard of before yeah. Yeah, edge margin canonical stuff. You've probably heard a lot of these, heard of, you know, some of these scenes. But, um, so we've, and also where we've been covering a lot of kind of more melodic or epic black metal, partly because that's what's going on today, uh, partly because when that style is done right, uh, we both really like it. Uh, so, you know, we had Oppressive Descent, we had last, last show we were doing Grundherd and Klagersturm. Uh, we've reviewed the committee, which is really melodic. This time, it's a little bit different from that kind of Finno-French melodic sound. Uh, yeah, and there's you're going to get a lot more. Yeah, there's a lot more dissonance, grit, darkness, and just sort of like high T aggression, um, which are, you know, what we come to this music for. Yeah. Um, other, you know, yeah. So, uh, um, so we're uh, we're mixing it up today. We're doing. Uh... You know, boy girl, boy girl seating uh, for the records today, uh-huh. and uh, I've got the opening record, uh, the closest thing to like a big one that's going to be on this show, because uh, I've got the new Black Funeral with Scourge of Lamash too. Uh, this has been released on well, the CD version is out on Iron Bonehead, I believe. The tape and vinyl versions are handled by some other labels, but uh, you know they're the guys who are really promoting this record right now. Uh, first record of theirs I've heard in a while. It's been like two or three records since I listened to it, so we'll dip into that. And uh, what's your first one? My first one is uh, Cult Offensive. Uh, and this is, let's see, Tak Yashem Yiprizhval Kashobe or something? Sobe? I don't know. I, sh- I sort of know how to pronounce <laughs> Czech because yeah. I have Czech family, but... This, this is a little beyond me. Um, you, you handle the uh, Czech stuff, I handle the Polish stuff, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. Polish is crazy, man. Um, <laughs> you gotta know which letters to completely ignore. Um, but, um, and this is out on uh, Hexen Cave Productions, which is in Slovakia. So the Czechs and the Slovaks, at least they've managed to reach an accord over black metal. Um, <laughs> it's Black nice metal to see. and thinking, you know, yeah, what well, well, we can all agree on, beer, the Carpathian Mountains, black metal, you know, uh... And uh, Cult Offensive is, well, I'll get into them more later, but uh, Hex and Cave's a great label. We'll also talk about that in a bit. And it's this kind of, uh, this band's been around for a while. It's very sort of uh, dissonant, demanding, and very faithful to some aspects of the Norse tradition, but not the ones that everyone always talks about. Yeah. Right? Um, And it's very Czech in some way. All right, so you're up next. Uh, uh, my second record is mm-hmm. from a new band called Carnal Misanthropy with their first uh, demo or EP. Not really sure what they would call it. Uh, anyway, it's called Release the Wolf. And this is out on a label called Oskio Productions, who I hadn't heard of before, but are apparently a very long-running Greek label that seems to mm. only release Greek bands. Uh, so I cool. think there's... Probably good to investigate them. There's probably some other stuff in there we should probably check out and dip into at some point. And uh, what we got around this is such a gentle way of putting it. You know what I mean? You got, like, I think after Destroyer 666, Unchain the Wolves, it's hard to, you know, it's, uh, you got to think of a, 
what words are there for the wolves? You've got unchain, you've got unleash, you've got release. <laughs> it's almost like you're it's almost like you're releasing him into the wild, like, you know, you're you're repopulating the wolves. But the album fucking rips and e- ejaculating the wolves. Start- the wolves. <laughs> <laughs> Wolf ejaculator. There, that's that's our band. That'd be a great um, black grind band. Yeah, Wolf Ejaculator. Fuck yeah. Okay, but um, this this album is totally sick, and the wolves are indeed unchained and ejaculating. Um, uh, and okay, so last one is uh, Laetitia in Holocaust. Um, I suppose I should specify that in Italian that means the firestorm. I don't think it's a direct reference to uh, the Holocaust. Um, it's, uh, and so it means something like Laetitia in, apo- J- Laetitia is joy. So it means something like joy in the apocalypse. Not one of those names that, you know, it's, uh, it's, the reference is easier to get in the Italian, I guess. Uh, okay. this record is Heritage <laughs> and it's out on Niffle Hell Records, which is a very small CD label. I think somewhere in Canada. Um, uh, Laetitia in Holocaust is a part of this tradition of Italian bands that we both really love uh, and it's sort of highly melodic but also extremely aggressive and has this um, the melodies aren't structured in the usual satanic war master way and it's got a lot of open space and breathing space and movement in it so that's pretty cool Yeah, I I like uh, it you know just so people know this is our uh, we're deep into it now, but this is actually our second pass at attempting this podcast. Last year, we tried to uh, yeah. start it up. Life got in the way, and we actually, on one of those first couple episodes that never got released, uh, we reviewed the last record by Laetitia and Holocaust. And I just thought it was funny because you gave exactly the same disclaimer when we did last year about the. Well, name. you know, you know what, I, you know how the internet is, right? Yeah, somebody, yeah, yeah. You know, somebody's gonna run and cry, and you gotta. But um, it's uh, it's. Yeah, and we did. Yes, did that last year too. Um, and uh, I think it's also just clarification because there could be a black metal band directly <laughs> referencing the Holocaust. I'm sure that's, there is. I'm yeah, sure there are true. like twenty of them. Yeah. Um, Alrighty. So, uh, but um, yeah. What's uh? And I'll I'll talk a little bit about our last year's review later uh, when we get back. To yeah. The album. yeah I think a thing we want to do when we start a Patreon is maybe we can make the uh, terminus. Uh, prototype podcasts available for patrons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we could find those, so, if we still have them. I, they, yeah, probably. All right. So, Black Funeral, Scourge of Lamash 2. You're a huge Black Funeral fan. Uh, uh, I listen. am. I've been listening to Black Funeral for a long time. I am one of the few people that really enjoys just about everything Black Funeral has done, including the, like, noise industrial records from their mid-period that a lot of people hate. I think those are actually excellent, and they're sort of a precursor to the uh, sort of industrial noise stuff that Havohe does today. Um, I do... Mm -hmm. If I was to say, I'm not a big... USBM person. I mean, that's not really a term that means anything anymore because so much US black metal is now directly imitating European melodic styles, but for a time period there was, and I'm not a big fan of most of it, but if I was going to say there's a big five oh. for it. What? What do you mean by you, right? Because when, when USBM, the phrase became a brand, it referred to most of these kind of at best, not that great sort of um, uh trendy bands in the sort of second half of the early OOs or the first half of the teens, right? You know? Oh, I wouldn't even uh, say... But I'm, you're using USBM... At, I'm going further you're back. You're using uh, USBM to talk about the 90s shit, right? That's, well, yeah. I, uh, when I think of USBM, I think of the, like, US, like, Norse core stuff, like uh, like Cult of Azazel or Thornspawn or stuff like that. Oh, sure, yeah, not the, great. No. That blast. Oh, the only, stuff. like, trad, the best... Possibly the best of the '90s trad sound in USBM stuff, or maybe early 2000s, would be Fog. Yeah, um, Fog was all right. A great band. But if I was yeah. going to say there's basically a big, as an equivalent to the Norwegian Big Five, my US mm-hmm. Big Five would pretty much be uh, Profanatica, Havohe, uh, Judas Iscariot, Demoncy, and Black Funeral, um, and Vaughn as a writer. Although they're kind of you know proto. Um, 
So mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I, no, and those are all important bands that you do love. Right? Yeah, I love all those bands, and I think that I think the Black Funeral. Um, I remember when I was first getting into metal, and in you know the early to mid two thousands, a lot mm-hmm. of people talked about them, but now they're kind of forgotten, which is uh, sort of oh. disappointing because if you think about it, Black Funeral has been a band since ninety three, so this is almost a thirty year career, and uh, just to get out in front of it, this record, Scourge of Lamash Two, is. As of right now, my favorite record of 2020. Hell yeah, that's cool, man. It's, you know, I think they released uh, one called Anku and the Death Fire a couple yeah. of years ago, and I think that did pretty well and was maybe also on Iron Bonehead. Yeah, well, that's so maybe there's been a slight resurgence. There has been, and that has to do with something we were going to talk about here, which is how uh, Michael Ford, the main guy from Black Funeral, on that record you're talking about. That's the one where he brought in uh, Asgore from Drowning the Light. Mm hmm. So I. Uh, and, and so, yeah, my question about this was I must confess, I mean, I haven't listened to it exhaustively, and, yeah. you know, taste changes, but I must confess, not a huge Drowning the Light guy. N- uh, neither am I. It's been years since I. Some of the related it. projects, like Eternum, I should be into because I like stuff about spears and wolves, but, like, can't get into so much that cluster of bands but here my question is you how much work is this guy doing on this particular album because there's definite kind of weird there's d the dsbme kind of uh strange melodic major key chording that i could see being brought from a dsbm band right and if he's writing some of the riffs here he's doing a fantastic job well to learn right. about this so, uh because i yeah. had those questions myself i decided to look into yeah. it and uh ford actually did an interview with a, a black metal blog uh alongside like the premiere of this record uh this just came out about a week ago um, and he was talking about how, in actuality, what we're listening to is mostly Asgore from Drowning the Light. Apparently, uh. the way Ford's been structuring this band is he's taken this sort of creative director approach where mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. he's coming up with all the themes and all the lyrics and the sort of greater ideas, and he's doing all the ambient work on the records, but the black metal itself is basically getting farmed out to his collaborator at the time. So most of the music you're hearing here, as far as I understand, is coming directly from Asgore. And as you were saying, I'm not a big Drowning the Light and the fan. Vocals, but the vocals are Ford, right? I believe they are. Yeah, I believe the vocals yeah. are Ford. The drumming is apparently like uh, an anonymous session drummer. Uh, nobody's mm-hmm. really sure who he is. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm not a big Drowning the Light fan, but this almost makes me want to go back and listen to it. Uh, because this, yeah, I know what you mean. If this suggests this, there's there a must lot be to something it. more going on. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, and uh, yeah, this is Asgore Drakenhof, 2015 to present, guitar, bass, keyboards, and yeah, this the, the other guy who who performs as uh, Ak- Akita Naktoder. Yeah, that's uh, Michael. Does is doing vocals and also yeah some bass maybe, but um, but uh, sorry, beer burp um. <laughs> But, but yeah, this is really interesting stuff. If I had one, I mean, this might be the only critical thing I say all episode, and I'm not even sure this is a criticism per se. The thing that's weird to me about this record, and mm-hmm. might be part of its unique character, is you can hear a little bit of that disjunct between the two people in it, because yeah, the lyrical themes are all this Mesopotamian stuff, right? This guy has spent a lot of time reading books of... Sumerian or Babylonian witchcraft. Yeah. And so we've got like Kasaptu Lamutu, uh, uh, the vampiric Rabisu at the threshold, uh, Nergal, not the guy from Behemoth, but the same <laughs> thing that they're referring to, Lord Who Prowls by Night, uh, Seven Udug Hul, Scourge of Lamashtu, She Who Strangles the Lamb, Gidum Hul, Bloodthirst of the Demonic Dead, Pazuzu, King of the Lilu Demons. So if I read a track list, I'd be expecting maybe not something that sounds like Melakesh, but at least some stylistic gestures in that direction. And interestingly, the music, and it might be good because some of these attempts to write Middle Eastern or Babylonian BM kind of fall flat. Um, The music is just, it's extremely eerie and weird and occult and very beautiful in a in a in a strange way. Yeah, weirdly it, weirdly d- happy a lot of the time. Yeah. You 
strange, yeah, strange spiritual ecstasis, yeah, and it's, um, and it's sort of, it's not what I'd immediately associate with any of that stuff. Not so at maybe all. it's this, an interesting... The, the yeah. style here took me completely by surprise, because this is... You know is, what it is? Yeah. Here's, here's, a, here's a way of trying to square the circle. The Exorcist, right? Yeah. The Exorcist is about Pazuzu. When Pazuzu takes over, you know, he's, he's erupting into the modern age or whatever, right? It's mm -hmm. like, it's not really doing ancient Babylonian shit, right? It's, yeah, it's um, reinterpreting For some itself. strange... For some strange reason, the Lord of Wings and Plagues has decided what he really wants to do is creep out an old uh, a mom and a priest by being a ten year old. Yeah, it's uh, dude. I know what'll really grow up about. I'll say swears. Um, it's a uh, but um but but it has that the, the Exorcist. Of course, it's a great movie, and it has this sort of gothic feel, and yeah. the music is really capital G gothic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think so, uh, yeah. Let's I, let, let you talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to say, to to kind of figure that out, I, I think this is, I think Michael Ford is a really interesting guy. Uh, he's been doing this kind of music in a very thankless way for a long time. He's mm -hmm. done a ton of different projects, most of which are not really black metal. They're mostly mm -hmm. into kind of industrial or ambient realms. Some of it's very good, some of it's very bad, but all of it is very mm -hmm. distinctly his own. He has not mm -hmm. really, he has progressed in his own personal niche, but he has not really developed, you know, technically or compositionally in the way that you would usually think. Yeah. He's just gone further well, like, down he, this rabbit these, hole. Yeah. A lot of a lot of the USBM dudes, I mean, the best side of American black metal, right, is a lot of these dudes are just... And, you know, the old death metal, too. These guys are working-class dudes who have jobs and shit. Right? Yeah, well, because like, Michael, so in addition to doing Black Funeral, he writes books about the occult, and I'm pretty sure he also has, like, a white-collar job alongside that. So yeah, 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 he's yeah. just been doing his, like, hermetic black metal thing for tons of years now. But enough background. Let's Let's play a sample, and we can get into... Like the real sonic quality of this. So I've got one. Sounds uh, th good. This is off the second track. It's called The Vampiric Rabisu at the Threshold. So let's just give that a try. Yeah, man. <laughs> That's just beautiful. You know, it's... when I first listened to this, I was, you know, doing, I, you know, I had my headphones on and it was probably like cooking or something. Mm -hmm. And the album really started to hit me harder later on, right? Yeah. When I was like, it was getting my attention. That is so fucking good. And yeah, I is. tried to choose something that I, there are so many parts on this that don't sound like capital B M capital bm black metal yeah that's just fucking i mean that could have come out of sweden in 95 right yeah no i that's mean it's it's gorgeous so this is a very difficult album to choose samples for and, and the power chords at the beginning right those kinds of um they're like boosted power chords maybe with an octave or something yeah i i don't know and they have that kind of hollow uh hollow grinding sound to them that gives them a little bit more uh torque than you'd normally get it's just that that was so that just reminds me of like this is what black metal is this is why i love it yeah you know? there's so like i said this is a very hard record to choose samples for because this is this is an album that really has an arc to it and i think you need mm -hmm. to listen mm -hmm. to the whole thing to fully appreciate it but it's also at the same time a mo an album that has at least one 
very solid climactic moment per song. So there's something for both the long and the short attention span, which I think is really important and something that people forget in extreme metal a lot of the time. You need to have yeah, both yeah, yeah. of those dimensions represented. The immediacy as well as like a greater narrative idea. A thought I had was that structurally, this album is very deliberately uh, a one-trick Whoa, cool. Crow just flew directly over where we're recording. Uh, <laughs> uh, good omen. Uh, hail Odin. Um, but um, uh, we've got uh, s- sort of structurally, this album really just is endless alternation between somewhat more uh, dark power chordy passages uh, that often don't really sound like second wave stuff at all and, yeah. uh, and are more like mid tempo. And then they'll switch switch to these melodies that was maybe the most normal melodic riff on this album right? yeah that really could have been like that, that could have been something. that could have been like an old uh like take riff actually like off the, the first yeah. record yeah 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 for sure the other melodies are just so strangely harmonized and so the the whole i think my guess is that all of our samples are going to be transitions between the more sort of uh grinding stuff and these melodic things but that's, that's the that's the outstanding great character of the record yes well what's something yeah. that's also that's interesting is structurally these songs are pretty much verse chorus songs that's what i mean yeah and there's just a verse and there's just a chorus you'd almost are there bridge parts or like c parts there are little bridges there was like a bridgey thing yeah. happening right after that riff yeah but it's very, I mean, most of these are just two, maybe three riff songs, but they're constructing them in a sort of ambient fashion of we bring in a keyboard voice, we change, you know, we add an octave to this chord, mm-hmm. you know, just iterating yeah. very slowly over the course of these songs. And, and uh, you know, yeah, if there's a third part, it's not so much a, yes, they do, I, I was going to bring that up later, uh, so we'll, we'll we'll get to that more, but so here's, let's talk about the keyboards then. Um this is, I chose this, I think this has some good keys in it. I chose this from uh, Pazuzu, King of the Lulu Demons. This is at the end. To mm-hmm. me, I thought this is some of the only stuff that sounds plausibly Mesopotamian, or at least sort of sort of in that vein. Um, yeah. Definitely also a more classically black metal part. Here you can hear the that specifically first wave American black metal thing, which has more in common with Baharit or Dem- uh well Demon Seed is like Baharit. That yeah. has more and is American. Has more in common with stuff like Baharit or uh with like Blasphemy than it does with the Norwegian bands. So mm-hmm. let's let's give this a try. Pazuzu and you'll hear some sick keys. Pazuzu right. came of the Lilo Demons and here we go. Yep. Jesus. The vocals on this album are great. The vocals are excellent, and they're very, very, like, articulate. You can pretty much hear everything that's said without a lyric sheet. I mean, you'll need it for the Mesopotamian stuff, but, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Despite how strange some of the thematic overlay is, 
it just, you can hear everything he's saying. He's talking about Babylonian demons over this sort of eerie, gothic, almost garage rock music at times. And it really works musically. Yeah, so, that's, that's um, kind of like a almost a Judas Iscariot thing. You know, that kind of garage rock mm-hmm. quality to this stripped down black metal. What I yeah, think, one could say that's a specifically American thing today. I, yeah, before I this think so. one, I, I started the day by listening to Mud Honey, and you mm-hmm. know, like, what does America have specifically? Well, we have the Stooges, we have the garage punk tradition. That's one thing we have. Yeah. Uh, and and that organ you get in a lot of 60s garage psych bands. It's like, yeah, it's not like gonna, a typical keyboard sound, it's an organ. I was going to compare that you know, to something like, uh, well, I was I, for that in particular, I compare that to something like Coven from the 1960s, you know, seminal, like, mm-hmm. occult psych rock. But what I think is really interesting about that sample in particular is that... The Monks... Yeah, mm-hmm. that that ripping black metal riff that composes most of that sample mm-hmm. is basically, I mean, that could be, there's a type of riff, and you've touched on it, it's, it's Beharit, it's Demoncy, it's also Vaughn. Um, mm-hmm. These riffs For that, sure. if you like doubled the tempo of the chord changes, they could almost be like grind riffs, in a sense. These just sawing two, three chord patterns. Sure, there, yeah, there's not, it's like one, uh, you know... Uh, reduced seventh or like flat seven one like semitone above yeah it just and there's very little like well, so, tonal quality to it in a sense and yet like what it's and but the thing is right it's like if you're a good songwriter you can write riffs like that for days yeah um and and the people who are new to the genre or the people who are new to the genre you'll just hear the big riffs and when you hear one of these riffs you'll be like oh it's just one of those riffs whatever man but the longer you listen the more interesting the craft of how you write a good riff like that becomes right because some of these riffs man yeah no i I wanted to say that's that's interesting because what i wanted to say about that riff is that would be a regular von or beharit riff or something but Mm -hmm. the cording is different there's a very different chord voicing happening within that sawing riff the chord shape is not a regular inverted fifth with an octave or something there's something different if the production's cloudy so i can't tell you exactly what it is but there's there's an internal dynamic to those individual chords that gives it a whole different uh, oh, feeling. Oh, especially there's the last note, there's a lift, and you can hear this clearly on the second part. This is also a good example of the small variations that make this album amazing. Yeah. So the riff is blasted at sixteenths at the beginning, right? And you get the continuous flow. And that sort of just that constant, like one to, uh, re- you know, flat seven thing, yeah. that's just a great, always sets a kind of barbaric or ancient mood. Dumb, dumb, dumb. You know, uh, yeah. and it goes into this beautiful, eerie thing where the keys are just playing the octave of the guitar riff, but somehow it still creates dissonance. Yeah. Um, well, there's, I think there's something going on. I think that they're, I'm not sure. I think that Do maybe think they're bending them slightly out of tune. Th- there is a, a deliberate out of tune quality that is consistent across the entire record. I yeah. think that. Yeah, yeah, it's not an error. I think that maybe the guitars, like in each channel, are just barely offset, like a specific frequency, so they're both around the same note, but just a little bit off, so it gives you this strange, like, uh, like microtonal dimension to what's going on, because there's a real yeah, yeah, richness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a... No, yes, I, I, and there's a real yeah. richness in the harmonic vocabulary, and the microtonal thing is very, quote-unquote, Eastern, right? Yeah, Microtones yeah. is big in Arabic and Indian music. Uh, There's clearly something uh, going on, and the, because one thing is Michael Ford, as an artist in Black Funeral, mm-hmm. was way ahead of the curve in appreciating the production side of this music as an instrument. So Wait, real quick before we go to production, can I just say the one other thing I was going to say specifically about oh, go that ahead. riff, yeah. which was yeah. So we go into this go into this cool thing where the guitars and the keys are a little off sync with each other or something, and then what comes out. The blasts are stuttering. They're doing the eighth note blast, which is classic Beharit, Demon C, Blasphemy, yeah. right? Um, and I'm glad those get used more now than they used to. Uh, just just everything clinking together. Blasting. Yeah. And so when it comes out of that soaring part, it just hits like, you know, the battering ram is, you know, at the gates of, you know, whoever you're, you're sieging. Um, and it's... Uh, 
And at the end, it's, it's easier to hear in that second part, but I think it was like that in the first rep too. There's this weird stutter or lift in the transition from the second to last to the last chord on that riff, yeah. which is one of its interesting voicing things, right? It sort of slides, something like that, you mm -hmm. know? It's And that's a detail that's basically a rhythmic detail and just a detail of the plane that you wouldn't get in a bog standard, not very interesting Barrett riff, right? Yeah. No, there's, I mean, they're, they're iterating on these extremely simple primordial black metal ideas. And I think it's just fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's get to another right, sample so, so we can talk about some of the really weird parts of this record. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you want to go to mine or yours? I was thinking we'd leave yours for the end because you yeah, loved sure. it so much. Yeah, let's go with yours. All right. All right, so this is the uh, Seven Udug Hu, uh, and um, this is just a lot of this record moves at mid-tempo and these kind of clattering mid-tempos, uh, mm -hmm. stomping or clattering, and you'll hear the garage rock thing, especially at the beginning of this sample. All right, so sure. uh, Seven Udug Hu. So let's uh, let's talk about um, these kind of melodic phrases that we're hearing here. Yeah, so at the beginning it was this mid-tempo thing, and although you could link that to the stompy black metal thing, it was also just kind of a rock beat, right? Yeah. I don't and think the it's, I don't think it's yeah. meant to come out as like a stomp, like heavy black metal part. No, but... it's it's not super stompy. Yeah, no, you couldn't two-step to that. Yeah, it's a. Uh... <laughs> That's the, it's a it's a rock idea and like you wrote and I think we both identified it's also a very emo idea. Yeah, I think we both probably had this like, are you hearing what I'm hearing, bro? Thing and yeah. like we were just talking in our chat like uh, it really. I mean, and we've said this before that like one of the distinctive things for better and for often for worse, uh, especially back in the day, but these days sometimes for better one of the distinctive things about a USBM sound is the way it might draw on emo or screamo, right? Not yeah. in the sense of these, not in the sense of these genres as kind of lame pop punk things, but more in the sense of them as branches of hardcore. Yeah, of authentic sort of 90s, emotions. Yeah. Emotional hardcore. And a sub yeah. suburban angsty feel, which is like, doesn't have to be, weak or stupid it's like half of america's sprawling fucking exurbs and concrete and yeah i mean it, you can grass you can read that into so, a black metal context as the natural isolation of an overgrown controlled society around you so oh yeah. sh oh sure some swedish stuff some dsbm from europe has that feel too in its own way yeah, yeah like um, a lot of the, the more urbane stuff yeah noctzeit the guy who was in i think it's noctzeit he, he's in uh he has this really sort of uh, intentionally fruity and kind of wonderful main project whose name I might forget. Uh, um, Luster. <laughs> Luster. Oh, Luster. Is like, wow, Luster's cool, man. It's so, yeah, it's so, he just goes for it, right? And he's gotten, it's changed a lot over time and it's always been good. Um, but so he's got this uh, side project that's just very hypnotic, droning, um, like suburban Iljarn. And it's fantastic. You can just see him sullenly pulling on his hoodie as the wind picks up. Right? <laughs> That's pretty dope. <laughs> Fuck it. Yeah. No, no, you'd love it, actually. So, um, I, and I think, I think there's a bigger discussion to be had here almost, because I, I've started to think, 
You know, it's something that's been creeping into my head, but especially since we've been doing the show and we've been talking more seriously about music, that maybe at this point, a little bit of emo, and as will become apparent on my last sample, a little bit of like metalcore or hardcore has really just become part of popular music lexicon, and by association, it snuck into black metal. And it's like, it's almost... These are just techniques that, I mean, are they even meaningfully attached to their original genre now that they've kind of, like, yeah, I mean, inseminated, like, all of music, you know? <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's clear that the person is making a nod. So, I mean, this isn't really emo per se, right? But we yeah, reviewed no. that Axis of Light thing, which you compared it, and it's like, there's a lot of kind of non-black metal guitar technique coming in, and the Axis of Light guys confirmed that, yes, it was really influenced by the Smiths. Yeah. They're from Manchester. And the Smiths has lovely, extremely authentically folk-influenced guitar work that sort of translates well to this stompy black metal context. Yeah. Um, I will yeah, say... I don't think there needs... I, I think one theme of this show is that neither of us have metalhead hang-ups about no, emo no, or metalcore or whatever. And so it's like, yeah, for some people it's totally unintentional. For others it's more intentional. But it's I, certainly I do think part this of is, what... I do think this is mostly unintentional here. On the Black Funeral record. Oh no, in this record for sure. I mean, I think, and I think that was the thing with DSBM in general is that a lot of people who played DSBM didn't realize what they were playing was filling a role analogous to emo. Basically, they were they were basically uh, like mineral songs with bad production, you know. <laughs> yeah, and to, to and to some degree they found their way there accidentally, and to yeah. some degree those guys probably had just listened to emo before they listened to that. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, it's it's eerie. It's distinctively American. Um, it's although the guys from Australia, right? It yeah. sort of fits the the drowning the light guy. It it fits with the USBM vibe. Um, There's a cultural and it's one thing that sets. Yeah. Yeah, if, if I heard somebody attempting certain kinds of, there's also a lot of emo stuff in a different way. In well, a lot of post hardcore and emo stuff, both in French stuff and in Drudk esque Slavonic stuff. Yeah. I, early on, not so much in the Druk, but later it becomes apparent that he's like literally listening to the more to like emo bands and shit. Yeah. Um, well, on that note, let yeah. me get to uh, my favorite moment on the album, which I think is very telling of all these influences we're talking about. Uh, this is off of yeah, yeah, yeah. the second to last track. Gidem Hul, Bloodthirst of the Demonic Dead. I love how absurdly grim these song titles are when a lot of the music sounds very cheerful, honestly. <laughs> I think they're I think what they're going for is a kind of um horrifying dissonance, you know what I mean? Maybe. Like the kind of like you know, like something strangely the the whole point is if you're really evil, it's strangely happy that the, you know, the Babylonian ancient demons are coming back or whatever. I think right? that's part of it. I think that, uh, I think that part of it also like has like the to... exorcist written from the perspective of Pazuzu. Yeah. I mean, I think a part Sick. of it is... Just... Everything's going great. <laughs> Every... <laughs> I think part of it has to do just where, where Michael is like in his life. And I'll talk about that a little bit after this sample. Mm -hmm. So let's okay. just listen to this. All right, cool.
Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, dude, that's the the vocals are insane, right? The, I know, and they're they're so. amazing because they're like theatrical and they're black metal and they're like extreme but they are also like you wrote in the chat pile up with the bros on the mic at the show shit it's like yeah what the fuck like yeah. i've never heard the two halves meet in this way before you know what i mean and this is and this yeah and oh, it's God. like maybe they'll be like super pissed that we're making this association but it's just regardless of the intent it's there. Dude, I mean, I don't, I don't think this they would even... sounds like emo. I don't think they would even be pissed off, because if you think about it, you can just interpret it as ecstatic and physical in this very, like, left-hand yeah. path occult way. This, like, this this no, that's... glory of the body and the majesty of, like, physical primal existence, you know? it's Makes sense to me, yeah. Yeah, this is that... Yeah, that's, that's why when we talk about the difference between death metal and humanity is this kind of corporeal thing and you, you sort of oppose it to black metal as the spirit mm -hmm. I'm well I'm a little leery of that just because people often associate I think wrongly right but often associate spirit with kind of immaterial transcendent evanescent thing right but in the pagan tradition or whatever spirit is power yeah, right? yeah. and it, it has this it's the moving it's the ex if, if in death metal there's this obsession with the matter the stuff the explosive stuff of the body yeah and the gore and whatever right the black metal sort of the glory of the violent body in motion yeah it's, um, i mean that's you true get that here for sure well that being right? said i think that you know it's, i think that part of that has to do with the fact that Black Funeral is not just an American black metal band, but one of the most seminal ones, and the fact that Michael mm -hmm. himself has never seemed to have any interest in replicating European black metal or, like, aspiring to be like it. I think there's a uniquely American quality to this music that I find really I agree. compelling. I agree. You know? And the garage rock thing, the emo thing, the fact that it doesn't... It's not swinging for the bleachers in the same way. No, like that's... It's a very, yeah. As you said, you found this... No, no, in a different way. I'm not saying that in a bad way. Oh, no, no, I agree this, with you. I agree with you. Yeah. It's like, you found this record really affecting, especially this part, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. This is like the most... This is the most emotionally affecting thing I've listened to on the yeah. show. Because it's... What this represents to me... And th this is going to get very absurd, so... I, so we're both guys we're, who are, we're, we're there man I mean yeah. what, what are we but absurd um, I, I guess here's the thing so I, I've been listening to Black Funeral basically as long as I've been listening to black metal you know maybe a year off or mm -hmm. something and in that mm -hmm. time I've gone from being like you know a young teenager into a guy in my 30s and it's like Mm -hmm. Well, shit, I mean, in that time, you know, I grew up and, you know, I, I, I've i had relationships, I'm married now, and I, I'm getting older, Aww. and oh, fuck off, mm -hmm. anyway, I'm getting older, mm -hmm. and now, as a result, my relationship to this music is changing, and I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, Same. Yeah. I don't hate that, and I really like the mm -hmm. fact that there are young kids out there who are making great music. But if you look at someone like Michael Ford, who I imagine is probably, at this point, in his late 40s, if not his 50s. Yeah, at, yeah, at least 15 years older than us. What's yeah. interesting is in that interview uh, that I was talking about, where he talked about bringing the guy from Dragon mm -hmm. Light on, he said, mm -hmm. I was ready to put Black Funeral to sleep until I started talking with Azorg a lot. And I, he, he had some ideas to, like, maybe do a new Black Funeral record. And I said, yeah, I'll bring him on as, like, my instrumental guy now. And there's a sense from this record, a a joy of, like, shedding any, like, old prior notions of how this music should sound or an image that needs Hang to be ups. projected. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. a... He's Michael Ford's gotten older, and he's happy doing his hermetic thing with his books on the occult. And there's, God, that's a great life. There's yeah, there's a real beauty to it, and not only that, but a freedom 
to pursue exactly what he wants. And there's, I'm not even, there are clunky parts of this album. I think that... Yeah, uh, metal freedom, metal freedom, which comes as a sort of, you know, Nietzsche says freedom is five steps from the door of oppression. That is, it's not this thing you essentially have and that you're given and that has to be guaranteed to you. Yeah, it's something freedom you struggle is sort of an action. It's something you assert. It's identical with the assertion, right? Yeah. And it's like, if you're some fucking hermetic weirdo who lives in a world that works completely against everything you want to do and you're like no fuck you i want to make black metal music i want to read cult yeah. books i'm going to be a demonologist and you do that and you're in your 40s and you, you you take a walk and you see the demons in the setting sun and you're happy yeah hell yeah no i think right? i think that's exactly that i mean a lot of this is definitely projection but they're just the idea that there's music that expresses this idea of as you get older, you're not getting slower. You're being freed from the shackles of your youth yes. is a, a fascinating idea. Yeah. And honestly, Michael, in these interviews, he sounds People really used happy. People to think more <laughs> about that. That's great. People, you know, I mean, the idea of, like, getting old is this fucking tragedy, right? I yeah. mean, that's pretty specific to the youth fetishist culture we've had for... You know, since maybe the 60s, right? Yeah, the people with like, the most consumable income. And if you want to go longer, since the early 19th century, where everyone's like, oh, the child. We must always be like the child. Innocent yeah. and yet full of growth and imagination. It's like, it's it's good to grow up, you know? And I mean, you know, maybe it's bad, you know, maybe once you have a catheter or whatever, you want to ask your relatives to, you know, yeah, you that's one thing. go. But, but like, you know, up to it, if you've got, you know, if you've got something going on upstairs and you've got good personal relationships and you're interested in, you know, if you're interested in uh, the proverbial strength and wisdom, well, the wisdom is going to, at least, is going to grow. Right? Yeah. And this is, there's something wise about this record, right? Yeah. I, I don't know. There's, uh, I mean, as I said, there's there's clunky parts on the record. Like, I don't think the, the ambient, the black metal merges too well. And there's, you know, the occasional uh, misstep. The, yeah, the ambient is the third element. And although it's better done than a lot of ambient, who cares? Yeah, it still doesn't really, it's like, fine, line up very well but mm-hmm. I've, I mean honestly that's part of the charm is the fact that he's just doing what he wants to do these things are a little clunky sometimes they don't line up it's just a pure expression I, you know I think yeah and I think basically like almost not always but sometimes if a black metal record's too perfect um, yeah. there's some of the excess that's specific to the music and the eccentricity is lost you know what I mean yeah, this is extremely like, eccentric in the best way yeah, like, I'll, and there's a kind, and related to that, there's a kind of mistake that might sort of divert something from the ideal, whatever you imagine that ideal to be, or whatever, but that doesn't detract from anything at all, if you're meeting it on its own terms, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, I didn't care that there was this ambient stuff in it, if anything, I was like, oh, those are some pretty cool, like, owl sounds or whatever, yeah. right? Um yeah, I think what I was going to say about not swinging for the bleachers also, I should clarify that. It's like European black metal. And, you know, I, I'm very grounded in a European black metal tradition. Yeah. That's where I'm sort of, I've always been devoted to that. Uh, and European black metal is really trying for a certain, at its best, goes for a certain kind of over-the-top aggression, sort of like triumphant storming might, sort of contempt and scorn. These sort of like very sublime aspects and the sublimity here comes in more subtly in those little like yeah. bursts of joy and it, it's, it has even to do with the tempo it has to do with the production it has to do with the riffing you know it's gritty it's very gritty it's, it's way grittier than an album with this much melody on it it's could be. not it's not um, music about being a babylonian warrior it's about being like a babylonian scholar and like walking around um, the hanging gardens and reading old tomes you know but also a Babylonian scholar now. Yeah, yeah. Because it has that garage rock quality, right? You know what I mean? You could make Babylonian scholar music that's swinging for the bleachers in its own way, right? Yeah, you could. Uh, but this is Babylonian scholar now, and some of these beats are just like, man, I'm just walking around. Yeah, there's, um, there's a humility even, to this music. A, a hum, a, an everydayness to it? In yeah. a good way. In the way that the garage punk bands have. You know, sometimes I forget... I spent years being really depressed. I mean, we, we've both struggled with yeah. depression, but I spent a few years being really depressed and listening to basically nothing but 
storming heathen black metal that always made me feel like the world was going to end. Yeah. And it sort of helped keep me, <laughs> helped it kept me just on baseline, just tense enough to keep living my life, right? <laughs> but at a certain, but like it was also miserable because, you know, if you're always ready for the final battle or some shit and you Kinda can't takes live, the energy out of you. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And everything else seemed, you know, right. And, and when I went back and started listening to my old punk records again and shit, it really helped. Yeah. You know? I mean, you can't, um, you can't stay in one mode all the time. That's a young man's game. No, sometimes <laughs> you just... Got, sometimes... Yeah, exactly. And sometimes you just gotta be, you know, a cool guy walking around the downtown with this shuffling garage rock beat, right? Yeah, and man. this record has that. Oh, you know what? A, a tag that I've tried to bring in on this show that we've talked about before. This is cool wizard music. Yeah, this, I, yeah, this is wizard music, definitely. This is cool wizard music. This is full-fledged wearing a pointy hat and everything, man. For sure, and you're like the cool wizard. As you said, you're reading your tomes, you're like, you know, you're gonna go commune with the spirits, you're um, traveling between dimensions, talking to gods, doing all that cool wizard shit. Um, and, and still just chilling the whole time, you know? <laughs> that's what I mean. Yes, exactly. Cool wizard music can be kind of intense, but it can never be like ripping and furious yeah right? yeah and i was gonna say Laetitia and holocaust is about as aggressive it's very aggressive but on this latest one for sure they've got they had cool wizard moments on the last one but we'll circle around to this at the end it's very this wizardly. is a very cool wizard album yeah exactly all right um, so i think that's a good spot uh if you haven't heard black funeral before this is a great album to start with and uh 100 percent fucking buy this one this is as i said want to repeat so far my favorite album of 2020 and yeah uh, we completely <laughs> endorse this and our uh yeah back it and i'm sure it'll show up at the year end on our show right uh, definitely all right let's take a quick break right. and then we'll get into some more shit all right so next up uh cult often zivi um this is a band that both of us were pretty early adopters for weren't we i wasn't um, oh you weren't I, I thought you heard, like, their first no. record. I know you were. It's possible that years ago you showed it to me and I said, I endorse this. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, no, I knew them, I've known Triumph Genus for a while, and I think I mentioned them once on this show. Triumph Genus is a related band that was actually founded by the same guys a little mm -hmm. bit later. Um, I think they're like Czech bands here. I think they're a little bit better known, because I feel like I hear that name pop Yeah, up. that's what I was going to say. They're better known, and it's a little more, as we're going to see, Cult of Enziffy has a sort of, I've said before on the show, I'm interested in a certain kind of quote-unquote boring black metal aesthetic. Yeah. Uh, Cult of Enziffy is defiantly not catchy. Yeah. Not sort of what you'd normally expect from Big Riffy. Um, yeah, Triumph Genus <laughs> has... It's not what you'd normally expect from Big Riffy. It was just a great... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. That was uh. Right, it's only gonna get lower yeah, IQ from there. Black metal's um, been conquered by the industry of big riff. We need to stop this. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of like the mission but, statement of this band, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's true. I mean, but yeah, Triumph Genus sounds more has a more kind of uh, you get some more noble storming shades of. Shades of classical music. It sounds a little more like Hate Forest or something. Uh, Cult, Cult, Cult of Zippy Zippy is almost deliberately anti-atmospheric in a sense. Some of the most... I would say it's highly... It's not atmospheric in that sense. Yeah, there's no <laughs> there's no space in it. Um, it's, 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 it's like... Um, it's willfully difficult music. I think Very. this is a good test... I would say that if I was going to, like, test someone on, like, whether they had passed to, like, the highest level of black metal, I would give them this. And I'd be like, do you find this interesting or if not? You can, if you can snatch um, the cult off and zivvy tape from my hand. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Draws sword. Uh, background starts moving. Um, but, uh, yeah, so this is... Cold Up and Ziffy, it's on this great label, Hexen Cave. Honestly, I was looking through this, and they put out Triumph Genus tapes, they have Cold Up and Ziffy, they have some great band called, uh, 
Have you ever heard of this? It's not Temnozor, it's Temnohor, which is... No, not familiar. You know, the Slovak version of the same word. It's fucking brilliant. It's, um, I'll talk about it some other time, but it's it's just, um, very unique kind of, uh, melodically interesting, but very primitive barbaric black metal. Uh, Mal- th- this, this place also distributes some Malakarpatan, and they have a distinct kind of design. A lot of these, they use a lot of blue in their colors and stuff. Hmm. So to anyone, I would highly recommend Hex and Cave. But, um, but yeah, this is, Cold Oven Ziffy is, uh, I think we both strongly associate this with Under a Funeral Moon, right? That's the, Under a Funeral Moon and like the back half of Transylvanian Hunger. You know, the, the songs that nobody mm-hmm. thinks about. Like, yeah, and I also say that a lot about Under a Funeral Moon too. It's like, if you're like, uh, you know, if, if you're real, you know, real heads know that the best two songs on Under a Funeral Moon are the last two ones that have two riffs each. Yeah, <laughs> Crossing right. the Triangle um, of Flames is pretty legendary. Flames. Yes, and uh, yeah, In the Deep, Deep as Skogans Fabn, or whatever, which I think means something like, In the Deep was Die. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, these sort of hammering minimalist dissonant songs right yeah and cold ovens if he just rubs your face in this although they use kind of more textured chords and kind of uh, arpeggios so let's let's start with an example and i think this is going to be a long sample you're going to hear like a third of the song it's almost yeah. two minutes but this has all the main strategies and techniques here because this is such a rigorously minimal record there won't be anything else on this record that isn't previewed here there's no so surprises this is, on this album <laughs> ain't no surprises the only surprise is that if you really like this music you'll end up really enjoying this even right. right despite the fact that it's not trying to entertain you um, All right, let's, so let's give a prochazim okolo vasich obedil yeah who knows just the beginning of this track basically of the beginning of the album all right let's roll um That's pretty That's, much the album. You're, yeah, if you don't like that, you won't like it. Um, it's what I really like about this record is there's basically it's almost like a classical composition. I don't know that you know. I'm sure, someone who was really knew about classical music could produce a deep cut example of this. But the basic example is Beethoven's Fifth. You know where it's got da 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 yeah. da, da da as like the germinal seed for the whole thing. And in, in a Beethoven symphony, it like develops, right? There's like, oh, it moves through all these different moods, and then it comes around at the end and yeah. fulfills itself and whatever, right? This doesn't do that at all. <laughs> no, at all. It just... But it has, takes a couple different little, very small motive ideas that are too small even to be a full riff. Basically, yeah. like, 
da, 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 just sort of descents by a fifth and a tritone, and then it'll invert those. Yeah. And it builds riffs out of those and just moves the root around, and that sort of da, 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 or, or that sort of da, 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 is just the basis for the whole thing. There's a Does quality. That make sense? Yeah, no, there's a quality to this record, and it was it was present on the earlier records. Like, if I, you I, don't if you don't like tritones, you're stuck, right? So it's like people have gotten into black metal in the last twenty years could almost or ten years could go almost just avoid tritones entirely. But that was like the basic whole. That was the over, central interval of the whole genre. Right? Over the past ten years. <laughs> Over the past ten years, you could have gotten into black metal and appreciably never heard anything like this. That's the the shitty the shitty side of Nicholas' influence. Yeah, right? I yeah. mean, you could totally, like but I mean, back in fucking the early two thousands, mid two thousands, all like half the shit oh. kind of sounded like this. Um, anything that was real black metal sound, yeah, most of the stuff that was real black metal sounded like this because it was really dark throny. Yeah, mm-hmm. and but that being said, so. There's a quality to this music that was kind of present on their previous records, but is really out front on this, which is, I almost think of this record as like a black metal exercise. There's something very demonstrative going on here, musically. These The earlier Cult Off and City songs, or albums, were more song-like. These are not very song-like compositions. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying that's that what I was going to say. Way. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, maybe let's maybe not say like it works as art. So it's what it is is intensely conceit-driven, right? He's got like a game, and you want it, he wants you to buy in, uh, and if you don't, fuck you, right? But um, and it's going to be one of the most inaccessible games you could play. Uh, but um, something I wrote in my notes is right, sort of like all the riffing is made out of the same material, right? Yeah, and no, it's just reconfigured is... in this iterative way, and that's the game that he wants you to play. There's a there's a um, deliberately like you know like a kind of like uh, 70s and 80s constrained writing exercises where oh you have to write you know yes. a short story without this letter or something. This is the black metal. Oh version yeah, no, of that. it's exactly. You know what is? I mean, the, I, I always come back to this, but you know, for new people of the show, I always talk about how good Discharge is, right? Yeah. It's like, right? The Discharge had forced songwriting parameters. There are two riffs per song. I don't think you can find a single song on here, not even on here, nothing, see nothing, which is a little more expansive. I don't think you can find a single song that doesn't have two riffs. Yeah. Um, two riffs, grindingly dissonant. That's part of where the heaviness comes from. And uh, the riffs usually don't have any more than like four note, four chords in them. That'd be a fancy discharge riff. Um, and uh, you know, very careful stricture on the vocals. And within that conceit, you have to generate the whole thing. And there is yeah. nothing on that discharge record, and nothing on this that resembles a conventional heavy metal hook. This right. is a this is a record where the vocabulary is limited to maybe like five words, but they're able to chop those up letter by letter mm-hmm. and rearrange yes. them. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's like there is no if you're into like big leads or sort of dramatic, memorable, isolated riffs, this album is will not be if you think that Rain and Blood is about the first and last songs, you know, you won't yeah. like this. Right. Um yeah. Let's try, uh, also something I really quick I want to say about that first example is that they do things that are like, th- that, that sample I played was long in part because I wanted people to hear the void in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where there's a lot of everything just where... slows down dramatically. Yeah. Uh, and the drums are sort of playing more out stuff. The guitars are just making these hanging chords. That's like often one of the worst things you can do in a black metal song that these yeah. orthodox bands would do constantly, right? It's like, well, we don't know what to do now, so uh, chiming arpeggio and mid-tempo or slow, right? Yeah. This makes those, because there's almost this jazzy feel to those open spots. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 really cool here, and so they're doing, <laughs> they're, they're working with basic rhythm building blocks of black metal and also with 
a technique that's basically intrinsically dangerous of interrupting a song midway through. Yeah. And they're just killing it. All right, let's go to your example. Yeah, well, my example is actually going to directly follow from that because this sample is dominated by one of those slur parts. And I want to talk about some of the weirder influences on this music. So this is off of uh, the second track. Stabuji <laughs> <So, laughs> de Ovsti Shorad. Now this, uh, I don't know what any. I don't know what any of these let's accents. Let's see. Let's see. Let me see. de Ovcic Orad. I don't know. You know something like that. I don't know what any of the accent signs mean. So let's just let's try that out real quick. All right. When the blasting comes back at the end there, there you can hear that, just like, tritone, tritone, I mean, well, tritone. I mean, the whole, right? I mean, honestly, all those riffs are just moving a tritone around. And mm-hmm. one of the things mm-hmm. I want to say is I detect a really substantial influence from, like, Black Sabbath and early occult rock on this, but not in the sense that they're pulling it from the little bits that were left over from second wave bands, but very directly. Because all the riffs there are directly... Black Sabbath were the first band to lean on tritones, right? One of the one of the very early Basically ones. Basically yeah. the first one to do it on purpose and as a regular thing, rather than for some yeah. one-off spoopy effect. Yeah, right? I mean, if you listen to the, mm-hmm. the self-titled track off the first Black Sabbath record... It's entirely based around a tritone and slight variations of that tritone, and it's very, very close to everything you're hearing in that sample there. Um, But, I I mean, it might not necessarily be directly from Sabbath. I mean, it might come from Root or something that would make a little bit more sense for this, like, Central European thing. Um, But that's that's a prominent technique that's used over and over, and it sounds just a little too close to the real thing to be an accident. Oh, I get that. I mean, I think part of the Czech BMZ, like this and this band and Triumph Genus are very different from what you normally think of as the Czech sound, which has this sort of, um, it's not like, you know, it has this, uh, a big part of Czech culture, as far as I can tell, is a certain kind of a uh, wacky sense of humor. Oh, kind definitely. Of like yeah. ludic, carnivalesque peasant humor. Yeah. Um, I look at and, the Czech uh, grind scene. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and even that'll come in even to the black metal stuff. And it doesn't necessarily make it... You can hear it as, in some sense, it's right. In it, Like we were talking about last time, it's not sort of swinging for the bleachers in the same way that Norwegian or Ukrainian stuff is or whatever. But it's, again, it has that kind of cool wizard vibe a lot, right? If you're talking about Root or Master's Hammer, um, right? They yeah. have like the Yilam Nietzsche occultist or whatever. Uh, and... Um, so you normally associate it with that, and it has this rock and rolly quality to it, right? There's a ton of that on Malakarpatan, who are big now. Yeah, but, so but very, very, these, like, in the background. Not obvious, like, most No, here, yeah, here it's really in the background. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, on, on, yeah, tri- on Cold of Enzivi and Triumph Genius, Triumph Genius just doesn't sound like rock. Here, that's like a subtext of the thing. I get that. You know, have I told this, this said this on the show before? I, I went to... Um, there's a really cool town in this sort of southern Czechia called Chesky Budjavice. Have I talked about this on the show? I Where, so. um, I, I was a couple summers ago with my family, and, um, it's this sort of dusty, post-industrial town in the, in, basically in the region where, 
that's really where Budweiser comes from. Budweiser is Germanicization yeah. of that, right? But Budovice, Budweiser. Um, and at various times in history, that's been in Germany uh, or in the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and it's, it's in the hops growing region. It's this sort of dust. It, they have a pencil factory there, too. <laughs> um, so it's this kind of like r- r- sort of rough around the edges small city that has a bunch of really cool shit in it, and it's all cheap. Uh, they have a really good, uh, really good sort of alt metal pub that looks very medieval, and they have a record store in the town square. And I think it's basically marks itself as like a rock record store, yeah. right? Like get your rock records. If you walk in, you can just buy spiked armbands. <laughs> you can get like you know, uh, like uh, it turns out that what the checks mean by rock is like Black Sabbath through Marduk, right? That's, yeah, <laughs> that's. Like, I mean, that's yeah. kind of like uh, that's kind of an it's Eastern European I, thing in general. Yeah, yeah, it's just rock. Yeah, if you if you like rock, you you like heavy metal. They had it just they had Masters Hammer records. Um, I got a really sick Man of War shirt. That's what I got. Uh, nice, but um, yeah. It's a. It was. It was pretty cool because it was a. It wasn't like a cool guy specialist metal record store. They didn't have upside down crosses on the walls. That's just their life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, re- I really like that place. Anyway, uh, you have anything else to say about this example? Uh, mm. Not really. Let's get. Let's get to your next one because then we can get a little bit more into the dynamics of the music. Yeah, more into the songwriting. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, I think this one's set up enough, so let's go to track three. Nehovarim Kudzuz Mina Musul. I don't fucking know. Okay. The last what, bit reminds what is, me. What does an accent mark over a Z mean? <laughs> Kudzuz. Oh, that, no, that makes it sort of like a Z thing, oh, I think. Okay, okay. But Nehovarim uh, Kudzuz Mina Musul. I mean, there's that Ukrainian band who are great, Luto Musil. Oh, I love it. But I have no idea how that sounds in Shaq, right? Yeah, that band's awesome. Okay, so let's start this. Sure. Um... You know, I was thinking as I listened to that, uh, especially based on the notes that you wrote for it, what this could be adjacent to, in, you know, not only under a funeral moon, but imagine uh, Death Crush with the thrash extracted from it. Yeah, no, I get that. There's a, a And, like, the production... I mean, this record doesn't have a kind of in-your-face aggression, right? It's a little no. remoter. Yeah, the, well, the, the, the production is very, like... Like everything is kind so like, of like Death pillow, Crush you know? with the, like if they re-recorded Death Crush, without the overt thrashiness and with the DMD, a production that's a little more like DMDS. Yeah, I mean right. because there's Death Crush here. There's like there's certain melodic ideas that are very approximate to like old Celtic Frost, like Emperor's Return era Celtic Frost or something. Oh. That's right, and because they're playing them with this sort of ringing guitar tone and often using, like, single notes or whatever, yeah. um, it doesn't overtly sound like Celtic Frost power chord shit, but I totally hear that. that yeah, just because, you know, it, 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 a lot of people kind of forget how early Celtic Frost melodically is extremely chromatic, like, a- aggressively mm-hmm. chromatic in a way that you wouldn't hear again until death metal got pretty far down the track, you know? Oh, yeah, we've talked about this, about how basically, as far as extremity goes, thrash metal is dead in the water compared to Hellhammer and Celtic Frost. Yeah. I mean, and, and then Bathory a couple of years later. Um, yeah, and even the weirdly major key rock and roll parts that 
don't really get ironed out until like to Megatherion. Yeah. Right? Those are still on morbid morbid tales. Uh even those parts, which I think are a minus um on some of the early Hellhammer and Kelder Frost, they make sense in the chromatic context, kind of, because you're almost like, what's this major interval doing disrupting my dissonance? It's, it's, right? it's, it's, it's even the major well, it's it's being what a chorus would be in a heavy metal record, a regular one. You know? Yeah, yeah. And and it just sort of functions because it's so out there, it just functions dissonantly. But anyway, um Yeah, so as far as the writing here, that's about as close as you'll get to a big riff with multiple notes or chords in it here. That second riff there. Um And it yeah, you can hear this the first riff, the rhythm riff, is more of this sort of pulse in tritone stuff, right? Da 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 I've written here, you know, the first riff is kind of hanging or swinging from the tritone. And then it kind of, as the next one comes in, it's like that motif, that little just pulse sort of starts piling up on itself. Yeah. Right? Da, 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 da. Well, that's also because there's, um, there's a second guitar line playing very far in the background, an arpeggiated mm. version of that root chord. And that's ringing cool. out over the course of the riff. Cool. Yeah, I, I didn't even notice that. Um, it's it's hard to pick out, but I was able to tell. It's like, oh, there's there's a guitar line that's just at the end, like the back twenty five percent of that riff, playing a little arpeggiated. It gives it an version. echoing feeling. I heard that. That's kind of yeah. what I mean, even about the piling up. Yeah. Yeah, that's. I think that's um, what you're getting is like the delay and the reverb to start piling with the addition of that extra guitar. It's an interesting technique. It's very ambitious for a record like this. And they're just, they have those two note phrases and they just start seg putting more of them together with changes in the root note. And so it's all this accumulate. Yeah, it's like the the, the riffs are sort of, yeah, building themselves. Yeah. Uh, and it's, um you know, we talk some about on the show about uh, music adjacency. <laughs> you know, the idea that in an age where we're, in an age where, let's say, that it becomes... Uh, Certain kinds of traditional riff forms, right? Certain certain minds have been mined for a long time, and to do something good, you have to really have a certain kind of either ingenuity or subtlety to do something good with it. Yeah. As far as making new riff forms, one thing you want to be thinking about is how can you make metal that sounds even fucking weirder without compromising on the basic metal black metalness of it, right? Or death yeah. metalness of it, and and so these are melodies. These riffs just don't sound like they don't sound like computer robotic, but they don't sound like they were written by a person either, right? It's, well, it's like I would say one of the. I mean, like you know I said, what it is? they're almost like golem riffs. Yeah, right. I, you know, one thing I want to point out: there's a very like earthy quality, like literally from the mm-hmm. dirt to this music, yes. which is an yeah, interesting yeah, kind yeah, of atmospheric yeah, yeah, idea. Yeah. But one thing I wanted to point out about this as a whole is. Uh, this is going to reference one of our earlier episodes, but, I mean, a lot of the melodic ideas here are similar to an album that you really disliked, which was the Odraza record from a few episodes back, I think. Well, the intense dissonance? Yeah, but the well, but what Odraza's doing is kind of arty skronk. Um, this certainly is skronky. You could not... This is definitely scrap. I think to me, this was the thing I was going to bring up, actually. It's post-DSO, let's say, yeah. and post the influence of certain kinds of abrasive post-hardcore on black mm-hmm. metal. Um, y- you get this introduction of different kinds of dissonance, right? The original black metal dissonance is tritone power chord or yeah. half-step power chord, right? Um, and there's a clarity to that. And then with DSO, you start to get these sort of at best, there are these densely textured chords that are interesting and pack a lot of tension into them. Ulcerate technic- might technically be a death metal band. I don't really even think so. Does things like that, right? Yeah. Does it well. At the worst, it's the trendy Icelandic bands who have yeah. these kinds of riffless, amorphous sawing, right? Where they're just holding down lots of dissonant intervals. Just how, how many um, strings can I play at the same time? On And every interval is ugly, you know? <laughs> Yeah, and it sort of loses any definition to it because there's it's just it's just smeared, um, yeah. and you know that happens with a lot of these sort of lazy, a lot of these high, you know, there are a lot of these highly 
labored DSO influenced projects that um, are like they're supposed to be really nasty and really fast and really intense, but they just are like our version of prog rock now, right? Yeah, pretty much. It's and and so um, I think to me, Odraza falls more in that vein. Yeah, I get doing these kinds of. Yeah, they, there's no, and I think what struck me about it then was I, I described it as having a kind of blankness to it. Mm-hmm. It had a kind of sterile guitar tone in the way that a lot of post-hardcore does, sometimes intentionally, yeah, sometimes for better, right? Um, but it had this sterile guitar tone, and it had this kind of, there wasn't, the riffs had this kind of formless quality to them. They weren't defined, and here, the riffs have an obscurity to them, Right, but they also have this clear-cut form, and the guitar tone is just really cool. Right? Yeah, it's and they're taking their time. They're not doing these sort of fancy chords or these runs with like leads and shit. They're doing these ringing, disciplined, bang, dong, 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 bang, dong, 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 and even when they move up to a higher power chord, right? The bang, that has a melodic effect just because it's so different. Um, I, I get what you mean, though. I mean, Odraza kind of is trying to produce a similar effect, right? Both of them sound urban. Yeah. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, to a degree, I would say so. Yeah. There's. I mean, I think yeah. this is just like a kind of central European stylistic trope, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a certain sort of melodic idea that we're hearing a like, lot from that region. To, to me, what they get, what Odraza gets from Dark Throne is like the Shadow of the Horns riff, which shows up all the time. And what this band gets from Dark Throne is clearly the more mystical, bizarre, and inaccessible parts of it. Yeah. Right. So the parts where Fenner is just blast for two minutes. Yeah. Um, so let's do my last sample and we'll tie this up because I, th- I think I've got like a, a good way to. Talk about how to recommend this record to people. So this is off Remind the, me to talk about the drums also. Okay, I'll remind you yeah, to talk about go. the drums. <laughs> All right, this is off the title track, so let's try that out. Mm-hmm. So I think that's one of the only moments on this record that sounds like super compellingly and obviously Czech. Interesting. How so? There is... A, 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 it's also one of the only moments that sounds really like head uh To a degree. I, I think there's something just about... I mean, obviously that riff is very... It's one of the more aggressive parts is what I mean. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's obviously a riff that has a ton in common with the rest of the riffs on this record. But Mm -hmm. the... uh, God, I wouldn't even call it dramatic, but they're operating at a different time signature there. I think it's 5-4. It's a little bit hard to count just because of the way this music is paced. Interesting. I didn't notice that. Yeah, so they've got... They're doing the 4-4 thing, but then they have this, like, hanging bar at the end Mm -hmm. that, you know... Yeah. They, like, drone that chord out at the end, and that's something that I've heard on other Czech bands. I don't have, like, immediate examples for you, but this... The way this whole passage operates strikes me Mm -hmm. as more immediately Czech than a lot of the record, and uh, I know you were going to talk about the drums, but real quick, I want to talk about the vocals, which I think are a real high point on this record. 
That's true. We haven't talked about that at all. The vocals, I, I just, I love it. And it's something distinct to this, like, Central European style. Some of the Polish guys use it. A lot of the Czech guys use it. Some of the Belgian guys use it. This, like, grumbling kind of hermetic thing. It's not even really, mm-hmm. like, it's not a black metal shriek. It's just this kind of, like, harsh spoken stuff. Uh, it's it's not even, yeah. like, it's not a singing performance in any meaningful way. It's... In another way, kind of, uh, you know, there's a kind of cool wizard thing going on here, too, right? I mean, it's like, it's yeah. like, who woke me up? Why <laughs> did you wake me up for this? There'd it, better be ale in it for me. It's, um, yeah, it's you like, know. and I like, I, I kind of like how this, I mean, I said this was like music without atmosphere, but that's not, that's not correct. The atmosphere is one of, that I really like in a lot of black metal, is hermeticism. This sort of like, it's grumpy. Yeah, it's grumpy. It's cantankerous. It's it's just like it, forest dweller, old man who doesn't yeah. want you, you know, in the place where yeah. the dark stars hang. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. It's um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Leave me alone is the uh, the yeah somebody growling at you over his tankard of ale and, yeah uh, you know or whatever right it's um it's almost uh, not fuck along you know you could almost um, associate with like and i mean you could take it in another direction and think of it as like uh uh like like it's a lovecraftian thing and you're an insmith with the fish people who don't want you in their town you know like it's uh mm-hmm, it's, it's mm-hmm. a very unique mood and i kind of like that quality to it but as you were saying, yeah, we don't we don't take kindly to humans. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> but as you're saying, the uh, the drum performance on this record is excellent, it's just phenomenal. And if the drums weren't as good as they were, maybe this would be like a B plus A minus record, where it's like, wow, lots of really interesting minimal riffing ideas, but there's these kind of static drums, and yeah. so it it's all just more conceptually interesting. Yeah. But one of the smart things about this, and I think it has in common with the Letitia and Holocaust later, is that there's a lot of space in it, right? The riffs leave space internally, right? It's even when there's continual trem, it's slow. There's like just a couple notes, right? And when there's plucking or like arpeggio, it's just these ringing notes. Mm -hmm. And then these moments of void where the guitar, everything slows down. And the drums are just, this drummer is a horse. Right? Yeah. If you were... The drummer he most sounds like is Hellhammer on DMBS. There's a very Hellhammer quality to the way he arranges his drum parts. It's like, the cool thing about... Or on Live in Leipzig also. There's... uh, Hellhammer is amazing because he's... uh, (coughs) He could, if he were trying to play like Gorgoroth or Marduk music... He would just, you know, play it, I don't know, 250 BPM or something, and they would have to give him a new snare after every song and whatever and whatever. <laughs> but when he's playing DMS, DDM, DMDS, he sounds so fucking fast and powerful, but he's playing under his full power. Yeah. And so he has all this room to do other stuff and to put groove and internal sort of... Uh, to play off of Euronymous's guitar, to sort of do these... Um, clattering you know sort of like tom fills yeah. um this has that and it's also almost has a jazzy quality to the drumming not in a lame way but yeah. in the way of like some jazz drummers just tap but i you know i saw it, it, people say jazz is dead or whatever but you can still see really good sort of free jazz or sort of like uh modal jazz or like sort of, sort of like 70s style kind of intensely groove driven afro futurist kind of shit and yeah. that's uh really good um and probably would interest a lot of people who like metal uh and I, i've seen saw one of these where the drummer just had a lead foot and a really heavy snare hand and he was blasting for half the song <laughs> right uh and he was just completely in control and he had this yeah. sort of liquid sense of groove that you wouldn't normally get in a metal drummer yeah but this guy's exactly like that well it's a, yeah because the yeah. thing that everyone forgets you know i was like oh hellhammer's really fast he can be really technical we want when he wants to what hellhammer mm-hmm. is and what makes his performances is that he's very relaxed while he's doing it you yes i don't think i've ever felt like hellhammer was going at 100% Trying. He's, and that's the yeah. difference between Hellhammer and Frost. Yeah. And Frost stuff can be cool because of that just, like, sure. constant hammering energy, but it's a different vibe. And, like, Hellhammer's drum performance is one of the things that makes 
Day Mystery is such a special record. Yeah. That relaxed quality to it. And for hammering drums, I would... Ra- yeah, Frost can have a cool thing, but for hammering drums, I'd rather hear someone who's less quote-unquote good. Right? Yeah. I'd rather hear someone who's just, you know, slightly off time or bashing it yeah. up or even like trim on the early Emperor records. I yeah, think I like yeah. better than Frost, per se, right? Yeah. Wait, who was drumming on the... um? Who was drumming on Under the Sign of Hell? Because the drums there are some of the best in just early Second Wave stuff. I um, have no idea. It's... Let me see. Um, that one gets sort of neglected because it follows the first two, and it's a little harsher. But it's like, it's just I, to me one of the ultimate second wave records. Uh, um, lineup: Grim, R.I.P. Nineteen ninety nine. So he 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 played so hard he died. <laughs> um, All right. Uh, to, so- to Valhalla, Grim. Um, I would say I guess my uh, my big take on this record is. You know who this is for? This is a record for people who play black metal, who who write yes. music and are interested, especially if you're like a one-man guy and you're just really interested mm-hmm. in kind of the nuts and bolts of songwriting. This is super mm-hmm. interesting from that perspective. I do not think if you're just a guy who likes black metal for cool riffs and blast beats, which are perfectly respectable things to like it for, I don't think you're going to get anything out of this. But if you want to view it from a much more like kind of technical musical perspective, Mm -hmm. then this is a very interesting kind of study guide for a very particular style of traditional black metal. And with that, I'd say maybe also if you're someone who has a religious interest in black metal, basically, whether it's like capital R religious or just kind of you relate to it that way. Like if you are interested in the mystical sort of, um, uh, the, the, if you're interested in the mystical disciplinary aspects of this music, this is something you'll really enjoy because it's trans inducing, it's demanding. Um, and although it's not overtly aggressive or heavy, it's sort of profoundly gritty. It's still rigorous Um, and martial in nature. Yeah. If you want to see the inside of the night, this is the inside of the night, man. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Oh. And with with that, we will uh, we'll t- we'll take another quick break, and then we'll get to something that's the, in a sense, the exact opposite of this record. So. For sure, for sure, absolutely. All, All right, right. for a moment. Okay, so next up, uh, in a radical departure from Cult Off and Zivi, we've got a record that's very fun, which is uh, Carnal Misanthropy yes. with Release the Wolf. Release the Wolf. Um, so I found this, yeah. so, I found this because, uh, so occasionally if there's like a slow week and I just can't think of like a more known record, I'll just go on like, mm-hmm. what are the newest bands on the metal archives? And I'll just like, oh sure. Yeah. Peek through who has like a brand new release, like their first release as a band. And this is one I stumbled across and I listened to like 15 seconds of skimming through a track off this. And I was like, oh yeah, I want to fucking do this <laughs> one. <laughs> You sold me on this. You were like, "You're gonna love it, man." It's like, uh, it's it's highly sword oriented. Oh, this is the uh, most this is the most sword oriented black metal record I've ever brought onto the podcast. I think <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's um, you also described it, and I, this is meant from both of us as a compliment. But you described it as like Varathron on crack, which is pretty um, accurate. I think. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um. Yeah, this is fucking sick. This is a really good example of, like, this band obviously can go places with this sound, but this is a really good example of a sort of not... It's not trying too hard to be anything fancy, but it's just a good, solid, uh, engaging black metal EP with, like, a couple real standout riffs on each track, right? Yeah, that's uh, one thing I, I did want to say. So this is this is steeped in Greek black metal tradition. Um, mm-hmm. This is a... It's a Greek band, and boy, is this a fucking Greek black metal record. And uh, like you were saying, yeah, there's... You know, it's a brand new band. I don't know anything about the lineup or anything, but uh, there's at least, like, two riffs per song that are just like a plus you know what i mean it's not yeah if, if you like listening to cult black metal and you like 
sort of epic, heroic sounding stuff, like you should absolutely pick this up and you'll listen to it a fair amount. This and is so put something else out and you'll get it too. This is so fucking heroic. I don't even know where mm-hmm. to begin. This and, is... and as we've talked about, barbaric heroic, right? This isn't yeah, the, yeah. the French chivalric scene. It's not really even Viking per se. It's like uh it's Conan. It's well, like it's, you were saying, it's fucking it's Conan. It's Conan. And as you said, this whole EP is just a Frank Frazetta painting you wrote in our Oh, notes. yeah, yeah, dude, dude. That was the first thing. I, like, when I heard this, I was like, dude, there's like, there's a guy with like too many abs on the cover. Uh, and, you know, there's a chick with huge tits who's like clinging to his leg while he Honestly, his they sword. should get someone to, yeah, yeah, they should get. They should get somebody should pick these guys up. This would fit very well on Iron Bonehead, and uh, then when they do, they should do a re-release with um, Paolo Girardi style Frank yeah. Frazetta art, or like a, a like, so- I, dude. Do you think Paolo Girardi could even draw a woman? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe Soriyama or something. You know? like, yeah, yeah, something just, like that. Anything yeah. in that classic eighties, nineties, just overwrought fantasy style would be perfect. Well, fuck it. Let's let's throw a sample out there just so people Fury know. Fury of Battle. We've got two samples off Fury of Battle. So I'll throw. I've got the. Uh! Early... <laughs> I've got the earlier one. So let's let's throw this on and let's yeah. just fucking let's just rock out. You know. Sort out, yeah, man. <laughs> Here's here's the note that I wrote red red verbata for the strike. Fuck yeah, bitch! Release the fucking wolf. I'm a powerful wolf with a huge dick, and all my girlfriends have huge tits plus very powerful magical swords, which they use to fight lizard men. After which we retire to my palace and we pork softly. <laughs> Is it, and I, I think that I really captured the essence of this record with that paragraph. You know what? That's one of the nice things about Conan is that aside from the moment where he's, he's boning the witch, um, Conan is um, Conan is ferocious in battle, but gentle and big-hearted. And uh, I'm, I'm sure his heart isn't the only thing that's big. But like, oh, uh, of course. you know, when he like, do you remember that sort of? The, the, they have the feast, and then he he and his Valkyrie girlfriend go to bed, and he's you know they they make love. He's tender, uh, yeah. or like the be- at the beginning, the guys who are training, right? The guys who the pit masters who learn to respect him are trained or something, or he goes and trains <laughs> in the Orient. That's it, and then finally they're like. You you have graduated, like you may um you, you may ravish the courtesan. And she's all like, Oh no, right? She thinks he's gonna just ravish her and he's like, No, I am gentle. Um, <laughs> Conan's a powerful barbarian, but he eats pussy too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's um he's and you know, that's classic. That really captures the night the nineteenth century quality of, of Robert Howard for sure. There's um, a there's a but yeah, so there's a juvenile quality I, to this music that rules, you know. But in the best way, right? Yeah, I yeah, mean, no, it's great. Yeah. It's, um, you, I, I want to say, like, one of the things that's distinctive about this, so obviously you can identify the core of this record with Rotting Christ or Verathron or whatever you want, mm-hmm. but it doesn't lean, it's very Greek, but it's not leaning on, like, worship of either of those bands. Yeah, uh, no, it's not. And one thing, you know more about the Greek scene than me, so I could be wrong, but with those spiraling leads, right, that big dramatic part here, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's more like Swedish sounding, right? Yeah, um, no, or definitely. Or even a little French yeah. sounding. 
And I think that, um, well, and, remember back on, like, one of our first few episodes, we were just kind of talking about shit, and I was talking about Varathron, and I played a clip off one of their, yes. like, mid-era mm-hmm. albums, and that's very mm-hmm. similar because that was almost like Greek black metal bringing in a melodic black death from Sweden into the style. Yeah, and, it's and there's a lot like of that Crow's here. Rain. Yeah, Crow's, Crow's Rain. Rain. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's there's Swedish stuff, and it's um, that's the most effective version of it on this EP. That's a standout riff. I that's think. that's um, like that that middle riff when that. And I love mm-hmm. how they're like, oh, dude, we got to drop the drums here when we play it the first time because that's how dope mm-hmm. this is. We know they well, it, like, they know it's the killer fucking riff. You know? gold. Yeah, and it has a great quality too because a lot of riffs are either ascending or descending. But that riff sort of just leaps up and then cascades down in this way, not in the sort of like rolling, flamboyant uh, French swashbuckler way, yeah. but it cascades down in the kind of like Thunderhammer fall, right? And it's, there's, uh, there's just... a, even this muted neoclassical quality to it, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's... Yeah, no, it's it's re- it's a golden riff. I would say there are other examples of that riffing on the album that are more. Uh, I would say that they're. It's important that they're there stylistically. Mm-hmm. Um, it sets it apart from things. They're good for what they are, but they're not like. They're not. They're not like distinctive like that one is. Yeah. I mean, I think like almost they could develop. That's a. Pl- it's. It's not bad. It, it's. It's a good thing on like a cult black metal EP. You want some distinct sound. You want some things that change it up. That's something they could develop. If you could make all those riffs that good, this would be a very formidable band, right? Yeah, that's so. true. At the same time, I think that the uh, this is one of the cases where I think the more like ripping aggressive stuff does a good job of balancing that out. Because I think a record... That's, full... Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Okay, because I was about to say a record full of riffs like that huge spiraling one would actually be too be much too even fruity. for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of um, Solitudo as a bunch of really good riffs like that. They're an Italian band. Uh... But somehow, even though a lot of them are harmonized really well, and even though it's really manly shit, it does get a little too sugary. Uh, yeah. So let's play my example. I was going to agree with you about that, because those those melodic leads are really just one part of the sound. Um, and so this is near the end of Fury of Battle, uh, and this is part of the barbarian feel of the record, where it gets a lot more sort of um, in, in the crush of the shield wall, so to speak. All right, let's um, try that. Yeah. Uh, Oh, also, should be noted that this whole track begins with some of the most loud medieval battle songs I've ever sounds I've ever heard. <laughs> you got to you got to have that sick fucking medieval battle sample in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, all right. All right, let's okay. go. Um Dude, when the vocals come in there, that's the kind of shit that makes my eyes bug out. Oh yeah, no, like, that's 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 a great counterpoint to my sample. This is the 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 darker version of that same kind of idea. It's still highly melodic, but it's rooted in drone. There's a lot of tension in it. Stylistically, the technique's got to be coming from Graveland directly or indirectly. Yeah. That's a lot like Thousand Sword stuff, but it's also got this sort of the sweeping up sort of single string thing is, uh, you know, Horna does shit like that sometimes, although not in the mm-hmm. same way. Uh, it's, it's It just taps into an ancient droning string instrument sound that Graveland nails, and that I think as far as in the Greek tradition, that comes in via Macabre Omen. Yeah, um, which is which is a band that struck me here. And I think, I, I mean, is, mm-hmm. is Macabre Omen like 
known by people yet? Because we've been singing yeah, the praises yeah, for Yeah, 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 they're big. Oh, they are? Yeah, Macabre, I mean, I don't know. I mean, they're not big, big, right? But um, uh, but they're respected, I think. Well, that's um, good. I, I'm glad that people yeah. give a shit about it. Because back in the day, nobody gave a shit. Um, and it's a one-man band, and it's, fu- you know, one man, yeah, Macabre Omen is a one-man band. And it's just, he takes years writing the albums. And when they come out, they sound like just you know vast um and he has a real ear for authentic folk melody and this droning quality and the riffs move and breathe and live well i've I've always this like i think of macabre omen as almost like uh imagine greek black metal meets some of the more sentimental and slower parts of Bathory, like One Road to Ace of mm-hmm. A. Like, One Road to Ace sure. of A, but Greek mm-hmm. is essentially whole Macabre Omen albums. Yeah, and also, like, th- that Bathory thing is also, like, mid-era Graveland or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just specifically that drony kind of corded, certain kind of corded drone-based guitar style. I mean, also, these riffs have... That riff there has Macabre Omen levels of detail in it. It's got interesting timing in it. It's multi-part. Um, it's super heavy, and I love that down... Macabre Omen also uses it a lot. That downbeat... That's straight chariot shit, man. That's like... People think about Greek heroes or whatever, and they think about like people with, like, you know... Or people think about ancient Greece, right? And they think about classical Athens or whatever, right? And it's sort of like, uh, whatever. People, right? The Iliad is one of the most barbaric pieces. It's the best piece of literature ever read, written. And it's also one of the most barbaric ever. Uh, and you read, like, descriptions of, like, Diomedes, like, riding people down on a fucking chariot you know with a, with a goddess guiding the chariot yeah it's shit, shit like it you know <laughs> it's some it's some f- cool barbaric greek shit yeah, yeah. man right, it's like um, they, they really all right so we you've got okay i've got another pick yeah go for it are you what were you gonna say oh no i was just gonna say i i, I really yeah, like let's just for that bar- oh i was gonna say i really like the uh you know, as it's, it would be easy to listen to this and just think of it as like, okay, so this is like a, a sugary interpretation of Greek black metal. But I you know, I think there's like a surprising amount of nuance to this music and the way these songs are structured and the kind of like emotional mm-hmm. and narrative arc of them. That's way beyond just how they appear at the first very immediate riff, you know? Yes, this is the upper end of sort of craftsman's cult black metal. And if they push it further, and honestly, I think if they get a raw sound, um, this will just be become first rate, I think. I, I can uh, see that, yeah. Yeah, it's um, the absolute nihilism is the next one. This is just more great. Uh, my writing is retarded barbarian riffs in a tense <laughs> melodic minor scale. This is what you want from the Greeks. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's like... And, uh, yeah, there's, you can hear the tension built into this riffing. It's, it's not a holding action. All right, let's, let's get that. I say rocks, great job, ain't no way to do all right. that's a great example of you know it's like we've said uh, i have a lot more tolerance for purely sugary melodic stuff but this is a really great album that's an example of what you appreciate which is the dynamic quality where the the more tense Mm -hmm. aggressive dark stuff 
works to reflect and kind of provide a, a quality contrast to those more like outwardly beautiful moments. And still has a melodic quality to it, right? Yeah, we're not this talking about, like, chainsaw dissonance yeah, or anything. But. Right, exactly. We like to joke, yeah, we got this running joke on the show about, like, you know, uh, uh, the death metal guy will be hearing this black metal track. He's like, oh, man, this great soaring, seamless melody. And then it'll go, like, interrupting <laughs> Dark Throne riff. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's and, and that's something I appreciate when it's done well. But uh, this is not like that. This is... I mean, some of my favorite bands are things like uh, Graveland, or we're coming up on it, Spite Extreme Wing, or uh, Hades uh, from Norway, or Treldom, or, yeah, I mean, you could name yeah. a lot that have this kind of, um, it would be hard, it never goes sort of uh, grinding tritone power chord, or if it doesn't usually, but it has these sort of furious, aggressive, sort of barbarian-sounding melodies in it. Yeah. That was a great example. Or also on the latter part of Panzer Division Marduk, where they start lighting up these slightly slightly more melodic riffs, right? Yeah. Um, no, I think... I, I'm liking this album even better as we talk about it. You know what I mean? It's so fucking fun, man. <laughs> like, it's... A, yeah. There's such a... a I, like, I, I was thinking before we did this, I was like, I fucking... I really hope this is made by a bunch of 17-year-olds. You know? Like, because that would really complete... Mm-hmm. Oh, that it. would be sick. <laughs> like, it's got yeah. that that just intense, youthful quality, which, which we'll get into, like, on my final mm-hmm. sample... <laughs> <laughs> which mm-hmm. is one of the most absurd and coolest parts of the album. So, I, let's just get into it. This is off Let's the, go. It's off the final track. It's called It's called Nocturnal Visions of the Ancient Monument. Fuck, man, I love dun, this. Dun, 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 <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> and this is towards the uh, the back end like the climax of the song. So, let's give this a try and talk about oh, yeah. it. Yeah. Fuck yeah, bros. This, like, my god. The cops are coming because of that fucking (laughs) riff. Yeah, the cops. Excuse me. We've heard there's um, a savage Hellenic paganism in this area. Um, uh, That was. So I admit to listening to this one pretty quick before we did the show. Yeah, yeah. Short. And uh, I don't think I even got. I found my clips before I even got there. When I said at the beginning that that first thing was the standout Swedish melodic riff. Well, that, so that's, is this. that's very Swedish, this one right here, yeah. Oh, yeah, and I love that they don't, that riff also, it's got some of the darkness built into it. It's it's a, it's a little, like, the parts of Sacramentum that people ignore, or the parts of Necrophobic. I mean, that could even be, like, adjacent to kind of an Emperor Breakdown part that wasn't power chord based. It was just, oh, we just uh-huh. slowed down the tremolo the riff leads. and arpeggiated, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it'd be a little more dissonant. It'd be a little more spooky for Emperor, but yeah, yeah, totally. I see what you mean. Yeah. This is, um, it's great. There's so many notes in it. You know what I mean? Like, that's a fully realized melody. These are, these are, don't, yeah, I don't want anyone to get the impression. I mean, we're obviously we're joking about this record a lot, but don't just because it's it's so fun, it's so high energy and spirit. Yeah. But don't get the impression that this is not intelligently made music. This is yeah. We very, often use the yeah. word. We, we I think a thing we value on this show. I mean, I actually I credit the specific term to my buddy. Uh, he used this term once and nailed it. He, he's stupid smart. Yeah, it's. 
stupid smart is a thing we like on this show where you're sort of go, go you're going full bore you're not worried about trying to prove you're smart and you're tapped into everything that's visceral and immediate and just cool about metal but you're doing it in a smart way i mean yeah i think that i think mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. that's close to what i was saying about like you need to have a short and a long attention span you know, in extreme metal, you you have to be there. Like at least for me, there really needs to be something happening in the mm-hmm. moment to draw me in. Which is where I think, for instance, a lot of dissonant black metal kind of throws me yeah, off. Yeah, like, it's the like most there's exciting nothing in the moment on a Sparta that's Daddy exciting. Everything's like based on this where very long arc. But here, like, oh, I think that's yeah. heavy, and then it'll just nothing else happens. Right? It's yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but here it's like these songs have arcs, no. But there there's immediate cool riffs, and honestly, it's like there's not really any functional B plus riffs, riffs on this record. Yeah. There's there's yeah. riffs that have purpose. Yeah. There's riffs that are like, okay, this is just like a driving standard. Of, yeah, which is fine. Um, this is just I don't know. This this is a really cool like palate cleanser record in a way. It's like. Oh, you let's know, just like, get in the about, moment to really another enjoy thing that was something great about that on a very, melody like, was very the counterpoint level in the rhythm guitar. And we, we can talked about this a little bit with this. oppressive descent. How like oppressive descent has <coughs> such a more fully realized sense of harmony than a lot of the stuff that people might immediately liken it to, like Finn Black yeah. or whatever. Where you know, often in those songs, the 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 rhythm ri- often in that style, mm-hmm. you get a rhythm riffs are just power chords playing roots. This was, the power chord was moving contrapuntally with the arpeggio, and both those in some sense, right? There's no yeah. fancy cording, there's not even the sliding. On this album, they do some of the sliding modified power chord yeah. stuff that you'd get on a French or Finnish record, but not a lot of it. Uh, it's just really good interaction between clear, starkly defined forms, right? Power chords and tremolo. The the Dorian scale yeah. is one of the only. It's very moves direct. There's that, no uh, there's no like um, cool musicians from the Republic on because this it was record. stern and martial and sort of uh, sort of enjoined manliness and sacrifice. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> it's uh you know yeah these guys fucking rule. I I we should definitely continue <laughs> supporting them. Maybe we should get them on the show at some point. I I would love to get drunk with these guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. No. Dude, we should I, I do would, an I interview to, where we just this get is a band that I'm going to be following. With this band. Oh fuck yeah! Well, actually, that's the thing. It's like I don't. <laughs> there's a. Uh, I actually. It could well, here's be the one funny guy. thing. There's no information on Metal Archives or their label. I don't know if this is a full band. I don't know if this is one guy. There's no. Yeah. It could be because you can yeah, you can I've tell this really is a very like this is a digitized all, like right? line so in think, guitar. Yeah, it it's could a be, drum machine. This could be a one it man. It could project. be one man if it is. Um, you know, if you're a drummer, oh, they're just yeah, they're just functional. Guy, yeah, right. Like, <laughs> you know, send him send him some drum tracks. Oh yeah, I I think I think that's one of the things like. I would like to hear yes. this with uh, yes. with full drums because it's like there's so and much like you could warm do that organic with, energy and you these could do riffs. that with line in. It could too. only could, be elevated by matching that with sound. the drums. The drum machine is fine; it's functional. I mean, but, yeah. obviously, having any place where you can practice at any reasonable volume is really difficult, um, especially if you're poor, right? It's um, but like so, if he could get it where he was working with an amp and having it's a live sound, but, I think this music would really benefit yeah. from it. Uh, but if not, who cares? You know, the songwriting is fantastic and the spirit is just, you know, what more do you want? Yeah. Yeah. No, like I, I that's going to be, that's going to be my fucking call to action is this thing on, uh, this EP oh, I'm gonna buy on it. Yeah, I'm going to buy it on Dan Camp right after this. Oh, by the way, you can follow me on Dan Camp. Hellhammer 666. Like, digitally. Continue. Just, like... Uh, it, it, it's like... <laughs> no, it's a, and I, I not only want to follow this band, I yeah. want to check out this label the that... Greeks, 
I checked it out a little bit on Metal Archives. This has been around for yeah, like 20 for sure. years, no, and we, I've never we heard of look it. more at it. So, um, yeah, same, I guess, with the Hexo Cave. there which, is again, stuff to check out. I Triumph Genus, but I didn't know there was this awesome Czech and Slovak label doing kind of uh, just very smart, demanding, traditionalist BM. No idea. Um, this is... This is, yeah, so Carnal Misanthropy fucking killed it. The Wolf is released, um, and it's, uh, yeah, you know, it's fucking hot chick wolves. Um, uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, what, what else was I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they're I mean, just, honestly, if it's a black metal album, they're I'd just wolves, but they have, like, like human right, tits but, and um, pussies you know, up. The, <laughs> I think that's literally a satanic war. I think on one of the werewolf albums, there literally is a werewolf just um, having a three-way with two, a night elf and a demon from World of Warcraft. I'm not fucking kidding. It's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, it's pretty good art. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, uh, yeah. Bookmark that yeah, one that for rules. later. Private, <laughs> that's private sick. mode. Uh, but um. <laughs> but um, but yeah, this is great. Though the one last name drop for this record uh, is uh, 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 Eschaton. Do you know them from Greece? Yeah, Eschaton is kind of you know it's 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 really deliberate. This has way more dimensions. Yeah, than yeah, Eschaton. yeah. Eschaton is I've deliberately one dimensional blast in Greek BM that sort of like. If Senor Voland is too complex for you and has too many sort of subtle about, yeah, they're moments more, they're of more subtlety or sort it, yeah. of moments of kind of evil or brooding guitar tone, Eschaton <laughs> is just purely like that with like just flattening blast beats for 20 minutes, right? Or a half hour. It's, um, yeah, it's just total, totally triumphant, right? Like, yeah, so good, good Greek black Which metal is that crosses cool. over more with some of these <laughs> other less Greek styles. Um, Yep. All right. Well, let's uh, take one last break, and we'll get to our last album of the night. All right. So, yeah. last record, uh, Laetitia and Holocaust. So let's just um, recreate the name. First I just pass at this podcast. Yeah, so where uh, did you? I mean, I actually don't remember I where did you find years, these guys. I sort of had the feeling that I was gonna want to do some, you know, uh, do some more metal kind of metal journalism stuff and i just followed followed everything i could on Bandcamp. you know i try to use it as a tool yeah. so i follow people who i find annoying i follow uh because they mm -hmm. have good they because not even because they have good taste but because they buy a lot of things i follow people of good taste <laughs> i follow people who just are yeah tapped into certain stuff and i follow every even if a label seems bad or not great if it's relevant to me i'll follow it uh and um so it just popped up uh latusha is oh you know what you can follow by tag yeah. and i'd followed the tag spite extreme wing um and, and yeah one of our favorite bands mm -hmm. um a band you showed me years ago um, <laughs> which is something but, we're gonna um, get deep so into I found, here <laughs> uh Fauci tra Fauci was their album that came out last year or fauci who knows oh i guess it's yeah, like yeah. the doctor you know dr fauci do mm -hmm, fauci yeah do you know that the I fucking, the fucking i think it's fa i think it's a, um a, a, a uh, but, ch uh, sound but um yeah, yeah for, for uh fauci tro fauci and we talked about it last year on a sort of prototype version of this that never yeah, got yeah. aired and that will probably air for patreon people at some point we'll put it up uh when we start a patreon or a subscribe star um and it's uh it was great this band had disappeared for like basically a decade and then they came out of nowhere with this album that i think this is, I think they're the closest to really, there's a nice movement of bands in Italy now who are rooted in the Spite Extreme Wing and the Invita Armada sound. Um, bands like uh, Solitudo and just all the things on, um, the, the label that does Solitudo yeah. are, are good. Um, I think it's something like, something about Eremito, something like Hermit Productions. There's um, Nova is great. Um, Nova has never been like an A band, but they always do like, pretty solid stuff um and uh nova's really good um flamen we compared last year with letitia and holocaust mm -hmm. um and i feel like at the time i was more into the flamen just because it had this really unique ecstatic vibe but 
as far as Latisha and Holocaust was a grower, and it was just the closest I think anyone's had to getting inside how Spite mm-hmm. Extreme Wing thought and writing an album that if they decided to do a, you know, go back to their more aggressive sound a little yeah. bit after Ultra, but also make it more proggy and introspective and mystical, it just would have been an album they would have written, right? It's, um... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that, uh, as a whole, Laetitia is more proggy. Especially and on this... More, I mean, yeah, uh, especially on this record, of which we'll talk about. It really sort of branches out is, a but lot I do, of I do basically uh, agree with what you're saying. Yeah, they, they have a sort of... There's a lot of breathing space in the songs, and they use a... I guess the thing to get in at the beginning is they use a fretless bass, um, which could make your music sound like jazz fusion, Um but doesn't um, often at their best on Fauci Tra Fauci they would often they would their best riffs often the guitar sounded like a mandolin or a lute being plucked insanely fast the most sort of crushing riffs and the bass under it just would have this would be plain yeah. detailed melodies and because it's fretless it also sounds kind of like a stringed instrument you know Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, the the whole fretless quality of the bass is not mm-hmm. so important. That's almost a shorthand for a black metal record where the bass matters, which it does genuinely for this band. There is a, and we'll get into that, there's a lot of yeah, often bass, the bass stuff the that happens on this record, guitar, which guitar, is sure. very dynamic and contributes heavily to the riffs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So real quick, let's just, um, for people who aren't tapped into the style of Italian black metal, I'm going to play my first sample. This is going to be the opening of the, we've got an intro track, but then the opening of the first real song. You know, just, uh, originally I wanted to yeah. leave Spike so Extreme Week to the wanna, end, but I think it's kind of necessary. If you don't know them, we've talked about them with Commodus a little bit too, but Commodus doesn't sound as much like them. Um, we we've talked about them in the abstract. What if we played a ideas. sample? So let's. How would you? Let's talk about this sample real quick Spike because Extreme we just played so it, I, I and then we'll talk about the Spike Extreme Wing. Does that make sense? Yeah. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I'll pull up a Spike Extreme Wing.
Yeah, I mean, that's fine. All right, so uh, what we just played was a minute yeah. of uh, Spike Extreme Wings Which uh, in Sula Vena off uh, Nandukor Duko. Which I once saw uh, on so the back that'll of some hopefully give you a little bit of context and spite shirt or whatever, and I almost thought of shouting her out oh, okay. like, I didn't "Oh yeah, <laughs> not Duke or Duke," and I thought, "Oh, she has no idea." <laughs> I think it's yeah, you, yeah. I think it might be like a like a kind of Italian aphorism or something, but uh, anyway, so so this is going to be really important to us talking about Laetitia because. So, mm-hmm. Spite Extreme Wing is a band who we yeah. discovered when we started talking. Or, uh, I had known about them for a little bit while I showed them to you. And, at the time, they were a basically a forgotten band. Like, nobody really gave a shit about them outside of the deepest reaches of the Italian black metal scene. But it feels like, nowadays, there is a whole yeah, wave and- of it's Italian like black a, metal bands, uh, Spite Extreme Wing were the core of a black circle, them. just generic term. Would you for say that's accurate? Black metal crew, basically, where it's guys who are friends and have a bunch of bands, right? But they're sort of uh, the Italian black circle was called Invita Armada, um, and uh, they were yeah. Invincible Armada or Invincible Fleet or whatever, right? And they uh, there were other bands like Janus and stuff. They weren't. They were all kind of interesting, but I think even at their best, they just sounded enough like Spite Extreme Wing to be interesting. There's another Italian band that I'd connect these guys with it who are old, um, called yeah. Let's see if this is yeah Herpus. I would connect to this uh, who are an old Italian band from 2005, which sounds a little more Norse, but uh, ex- kind of similar idea um you know rooted in when you know the idea is like how do you do black metal that's specifically italian well it has to be southern right it has to have something it can't be about coldness Mm -hmm. and this cold guitar tone um it has to have um a kind of where the typical black metal feel for the norris bands is something like what, like some a little bit like Elric of Melniborn, right? It's like, wow, how does that emaciated elfin man wield that gigantic cursed sword, right? The right, the, the sort of um, the it, italic feel is very manly, right? <laughs> and it's manly by being flamboyant. It's sort of uh, we talked about that. A- yeah. It it has it has. Yeah, it has it has so much mm-hmm. confidence in its masculinity that it can go into these absurdly florid yeah. melodic and the aesthetic, directions. I think, without, you know, without any a, the philosophical vibe is coming from I mean, in the ancient Roman stuff, obviously. Uh, also, but also, Spite Extreme Wing just pulls the same way that the earliest, the smartest of the early Norse bands, like Emperor, activates this whole tradition of sort of like, let's say. Um, dark side Teutonic references, right? Or like Nordic, you know, I mean, everything from, right, you get this kind of like, you get the, you get the Vikings, you get Nietzsche, you get kind of uh, Grieg and Wagner, um, all this kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, that this, this starts to come like together. Some of those terms become associated with each other in the late 18th, early, for lack of or late 19th, term. early 20th yeah. century. Um, with Italy, Spite Extreme Wing has the same thing, where they grasp that all these things are kind of related. So they're into ancient Rome. I think they're kind of into the Renaissance. Um, a lot of people instantly associate them with Julius Savola and perennialism. Um, that's not wrong. I think that's a huge influence on them. Um, but And I think, no... Mm-hmm. And a huge influence on all these Italian bands. However, the, what, when people but think it's about not the Evola only one, whatever, it's not as it's, it's not as reductive kind of, as that. Yeah, let's call it square and very kind of like uh, um, stereotypically conservative traditionalism. Stick up your ass traditionalism that uses Evola as a kind of root, um, and they forget that he was a Dadaist at first. Um, or like in the beginning yeah. of Ride the Tiger, he's like doing kind of somewhat critical, but very serious reviews of yeah. like per, the perceptions, the sort of interesting percept, kind of nihilistic, but productive ideas of modernity that you get people like, uh, fucking, um, 
what, what's in um there there there. I'm going to uh, I'm I'm gonna brain fart, but um in Henry Miller or in uh or in even kind of in Allen Ginsberg and shit, he's like responding to all this avant garde <laughs> modern art kind of stuff. Um, and he was as part of the same milieu as like the Italian futurists. Okay. And another people, thing that Spider Stramer really likes is uh, Gabriella yeah. D'Annunzio, who has one of the and I think they mention him more than Evola yeah. in their interviews. He's like an Italian novelist and sort of mystic who was a world okay. a heroic World War I pilot who then led a kind of, um, <laughs> after the war, he, he, he led a coup d'etat in a city across the Adriatic and was trying to turn it into this kind of um, futuro, uh, you know, sort of, uh, <laughs> so, sort of, I guess, like, this kind of futuristic but kind of also uh, aristocratic society where he said, we want the ruling principle of the, the city to be music. <laughs> and, yeah, he eventually got deposed, and then he got sort of, you know, Mussolini kind of ripped him off, and then eventually <laughs> stabbed him in dope. the back and probably had him thrown out a window. But they couldn't kill him, so he just had his legs broken. Um, but, yeah, so that's... So Gabriel D'Annunzio, sort, of, um, it, sort of Italian avant-garde yeah. Chad. Um, <laughs> and th this kind of sort of, like, punk... Futurist punk paganism is really big for Spite Extremo <laughs> and for Laetitia and Holocaust, I think, and for a lot of these bands. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah. And let's get back to the music. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, it does make sense. So to, to wrap it back, I was about to say to wrap it back around towards the music. So the defining qualities of Spite Extreme Wing are obviously italian folk inspired melodies an extremely incisive really uh, cleaner trend. than usual guitar tone and guitar style very precise He's picking with his whole forearm, picking. Right. um very powerful trem very uh, yeah very very aggressive kind of cascading drumming but also a subtle technicality that flows through everything. And it's, um, you know, this well, is yeah, not, the very you cannot pick up and play this the way you can way. in most um, stuff. I think so, like, so let's say yeah. similarities um, for this type. Let's compare that riff from Insula Veda to the main riff on Dissolution of Black Pastures that we just played. Um, uh, it's, um, on Dissolution of Black Pastures, the thing they have yeah. in common, right, is, uh, melodic ideas that sort of have roots in Swedish black death, like Sacramentum or Dawn or whatever, meeting with, stylistically, meeting with a real just core of hardcore punk influence. Um, like coming... F yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's a, a definite, a very mm -hmm. polished sort of because we we got to remember there's this huge italo punk scene that a lot of people yeah, forgot it's, um, about it's in both that of these it, i think it's crucial a similar to the overall sound so of this the, the insula Vetta, you get the bouncing between this sort of um this uh this rolling just root note you know maybe just like low e or d power chord trem and then this color that comes from the you know that comes from arpeggiated color uh higher up on the fretboard right and same mm -hmm. with dissolution of black pastors. They're like almost chugging, right? They're hitting, they're hitting the the power chords really hard. And then they come in with this sort of uh, florid and cascading arpeggiated stuff. I gotta say, I love just off uh, dissolution of black pastors, like. I love it when a band does like a melodically intricate guitar. Oh, yeah. Or, excuse me, rhythmically it's, intricate. I mean, guitar oh, so that's the other thing. Just the, has the, the drums the, the thumping away with the Swedish stuff. The common fucking denominator love that effect. The Swedish it's stuff so cool. The hardcore influence, which for Spite Extreme One was really late, like Earth AD Misfits or like Wolf's Blood Misfits, um, is uh, is thrash and especially like Creator. Like the the mm -hmm. totally the 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 not so yeah. ripping eighties thrash. There's this kind of way of writing songs that are uh, that have this kind of rolling pedal. The the whole idea of rolling pedal point, where you're moving between the higher the higher chords and the lower chords, is just fundamental for both of these bands. It's um yes. 
Yeah, yeah. so... Uh, here, well, let's, yeah, uh, let's go. Let's so expand this man, on unlike this. Let's Spider get Spider Streaming allows no space anywhere, ever. The whole thing fucking rips. There's oh, Even when it's slow, it's crushing. And you only get space when they Not go to the weird all. ambient very track dense. where they have like, very people dense. screaming and shit. <laughs> like, ear, ear, ear. Um, which are awesome. But um, ex- Exemplum on this uh, heritage by Letitia <laughs> has... Uh, it's got that sort of... It, it's got a it's got a lot of space in it, even though it's really aggressive. So this is a second part of what I'd call the aggressive base of this album. Uh, let's listen to this. Mm. Like, that's a metalcore riff, but, uh, right, certainly not the most original rhythmic choice for the guitar, <laughs> but, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just responding to a potential objection, you know, uh, I wouldn't dong, even dong, dong, necessarily dong, dong, think dong, of it like dong. that, but, but, um, but like, so what makes that cool? Well, first of all, it's being used contrastively yeah. against faster stuff in a good way, yeah. uh, Second of all, it's unusual in the black metal record, uh, and there's lots of opening, open space in it. Yeah. It's not really a chug riff. Um, you can hear the sort of, uh, and there's this really good sort of polyrhythmic drumming under it, right? Just dr- octopus arms, toms, and double bass. Uh, and um, yeah. it, it sort of opens it up. And then, you know, if they'd continued that forever, maybe it started, would, have to sound, would have started to sound like the jazzy version of Chaos AD or something, but they didn't. Um, and it goes back into that glorious spiraling melody, right? Uh, yeah. And one other basis... You gotta go say what you were gonna say. Mm-hmm. Well, I think... Oh, no, I just... Um, to... To bring it to Spite Extremely, one thing that's worthy of note here is that uh, in contrast to the previous record we've talked mm-hmm. about, Fauci Tree Fauci, uh, that has a lot more to do with early Spite Extreme Wing, and I think this record has a lot more to do with the latter half of their catalog, which is a little more invested in, uh, I, I guess, you know, to a degree, well, you're mostly kind of 70s ultra, prog right? or 70s... Uh, Italian soundtrack music, there's a lot of mm-hmm. mostly ultra. There's there's it peaks out on Cosmic Crater. Um and mm-hmm. this is not to say that it's bad in any way, because Ultra competes with Magnificat for my favorite Spike Extreme Wing record. Um but but there's a lot of influences from 70s prog, there's influences from 70s soundtrack music like uh, giallo horror films as well as like spaghetti westerns which obviously were all filmed in Italy uh, there's a, a wide palette of influences and I think that awesome. so here, yeah like Tisha and Holocaust yeah, for really sure. like there's into ultra the for sure starts going in a proggy direction um, and it's uh you, you get so what sort of what's proggy about this part like the drums and then the sort of guitar the, the sort of free floating arpeggiated stuff going on with the guitars over it mm. I think our our latter two samples are more. Prog, I would say, I, think, I, I honestly, yeah. I th- I think it hangs over the whole. What? Mm-hmm. There, yeah, the latter two samples are more proggy, but I, I think mm-hmm. it hangs over the entire album. And actually, well, you know, this is a good place to get to my next sample, and uh, that's also talk I about generally really something hate that you know, based on your perspective, and can one be of a the uh, or great things about Spite Extreme Wing is how anti-prog so the, rock some of the songwriting is. Just 
you know, they have, you know, they have breakdowns, but the breakdowns are like slam your face into the wall sort of breakdowns. Um, there's like, uh, there, in, no, 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 exactly. That's what, but I'm saying like Spike, so Spike Extreme Wing has this. Yeah, I'm not comparing this to Genesis or anything. <laughs> songwriting, which then they open up a little bit on their last album. This album is proggy, but not in an annoying way. Right, I am not annoyed by the progginess here. It it really adds something to it, and it gives it a different feel, which is we can get into a little. Yeah, no, no, no. Okay, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's get to my next sample. This is off a track called "Of Courage and Deity." So let's listen to this, and I'll I'll talk about something that's kind of like a bit debatable. It's very cool. So there's a couple things I want to address here. One is this is a great example mm -hmm. of the bass and drum performances, which really elevate this record substantially. Um, I think the riffs on this record are good, but they're not. They're well, not spiked and there's also credit level, to be where basically for every riff is an A plus riff that's that immediately exquisite. memorable. Spider Stream Wing has never written a fancy riff in their life. This band is very good at writing. Uh, uh, Laetitia is good at writing fancy riffs, which is a strength and also a weakness, right? Uh, as in, like, um, but like, yeah, yeah. One thing I want to say real quick about yeah, the, no, they're they're much fancier uh, in general. I was thinking, um, about the shit brain fart. It's starting to be brain fart hour, man. It's um, but the um, yeah, we'll come back to it. Um. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, well, so here's the thing that I want to say is like this might be a weakness of the record, mm -hmm. and it might just be me not listening to it enough. I think mm -hmm. that Fauci Tree Fa Fauci, excuse me, is probably a slightly stronger record, just because. Uh, this record feels a little fragmented. And feels a little bit like... So, this is a 30-minute record. And the last song is like a six-minute instrumental. It's very good, but, you know, it's a, it's mostly a jam session. And you've got, you know, a, a minute and a half of intro at the beginning of the record. So, what we've got is a pretty small array of musical ideas. And I think this is a band that needs more time to really develop the narrative ideas. So I, this feels a little Yeah, so I can, I can go with that. I think what this is is like a band it's a, that like a you know, went away for a long you know time what I mean? and is now capitalizing on the fact that they're back and try not to lose focus, right? Um, I think, yeah, Fauci was just... Yeah, Fauci is closer. If you want just to think yeah, that's a Fauci got some black attention. metal album... Yeah. Fauci is like that, except it also has this introspective and kind of, uh, yeah, mystic quality to it, a sort of shamanic quality, right? Um, there, there will be, there are parts that just really do sound a lot like Spite Extreme Wing in the yeah. best way. There are some fantastic, fancy kind of lead harmonized riffs, especially on the last track, that are just like things that Spite Extreme Wing didn't do. Uh, here, they're reprising a lot of the themes from that album. 
Um, like a lot of the riffs, you'll hear initial mm -hmm. versions of the melodies that are maybe sort of more clearly defined as riffs on Fauci. Here they're like developing them. Um, it reminds me of, I mean, I guess I've brought up Serpent Column a few times, but like yeah. Serpent Column after uh, Mirror in Darkness um, wrote uh, Endless Detainments, this EP, which was actually really successful. Um, and the EP was written in a shorter also did this with the first album, the Invicta record that came out right after mm -hmm. Ornithi Thalassa, not right after, a year after Ornithi Thalassa. It's sort of like when you have momentum, you write another short thing that's different and you sort of develop some of the themes in different ways. Uh, and, and yeah. Mm -hmm. And I can, I can appreciate that, but I, I, I still get the sense that it's like, a lot of it these songs feel like they are That's very what I was gonna good, say. Yeah, very good detailed, R &D. but still yeah, kind of it, sketches it's like the EP of ideas the album, that will be fully not realized EP, right? so It's long enough to be a record, but the work following the album is R&D for future stuff. You know who else does this is Horn. Um, Horn put out, uh, you know, uh, sort of Term I'm Hang was just like awesome and just like a complete step up yeah. from anything he'd done before. Uh, and then he did this because he was introducing this more traditionally black metal sound, he put out some rec EP maybe a year after it that was um, written in the same sessions or just after and was just like ripping fast sort of versions of the same themes. Um, and it was cool, but it felt dependent on the thing before it and also preparing. And as we talked about yeah. on the very first episode of this show with the, with the new horn, with Moan Gang, now the blast beats are really in the front in a way that's new for the band, right? So, yeah. Yeah, and I can I can appreciate that, but I, 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 I guess my issue is, if you're a band like Laetitia, and you are going to place yourself... It is, in and it is very jammy. Very, in like, I, I would say this is a very prog forward record. If you're going to mm -hmm. place your... It, yeah, it... it if you're going to place yourself into that sphere, my expectations for the yeah, whole narrative I guess. I, I arc think, I think of, of your this record are going to go up Fauci, commensurate. Which might make it you know less I mean? of its own work. But at the same time, I think it's accomplishing the work it wants to do, which is to build out the sound in a lot of interesting ways. And I agree, it will become more useful going forward. Do you think you would not have that feel? Could it have been an EP of proggy stuff and you'd feel like not feel that? I, I I think mm, I think if they had done an EP where they cut off yeah, the first I mean, and I the think, last yeah, track, so I think it's quite it might be a, another, a good thing about this, right? Is that like whereas bands like Nova or Solitudo are kind of almost they're reprising elements of the Spite Extreme Wing sound and not quite bringing out different little aspects of it in ways that sort of split it off, like and. Uh, you know, Solitudo sounds more like Mellow Death, kind of, not in a bad way. Uh, Nova sounds more like Finnish or French stuff, um, and kind of has a more polished, kind of graceful sound. Mm -hmm. um, th although their last one actually had some similarities to this. There was a lot of energetic chugging and shit on it, but the songs all cut mm -hmm. off after like two and a half minutes or three minutes, which was weird. Um but, like, these these other bands are sort of taking these little strands and developing them. Laetitia's going for a comprehensive yeah. sound that has is broad and that fully develops this tradition. And so this album is certainly working toward that. Yeah. I, I get that, yeah. and I... I, I, I no, agree. I'm saying I agree I just that think I think the one after this is going to be at, you know, literally in terms of the album. Like, honestly, for this to be... F yeah. Okay, well, let's sample... I think this might um, need to be... But yeah, like needless to say, this to is a band we really believe in really and would like to follow more albums. on the show. Uh, yeah. It's really good. Also, I will say... Yeah, no, 100%. I, I, I don't want to give the impression that I, I dislike this. I liked this it a lot really at good. first. I liked it more, like, when I last listened to it a month ago. You know? It's, um... it. So this album, you know, I get what you're saying. I totally do. And also, I'm just always going to prefer stuff that's more riff forward. Um, but um, it 
it might be a grower as well because there's just so many interesting little there's a lot of interesting little details here and maybe my last sample will help bring that out um, yeah that's a possibility this is from the title track heritage um and uh this is a thing that they didn't really sure. do on fauci Tra fauci and it's really good here um I would say that it's excellent, and that mm-hmm. that reminds me very closely of a lot of the more chill the out stuff on Ultra. The um, arpeggiating when they're stuff really there is reaching uh, into not the something you hear quite in the same way. It's just like, really this relaxing. This, it's yeah, that's not Spike Extreme Wing doesn't really do that. Um, they're into these big thick chords or leads. Um, it's much more intricate. It's like their version of a French thing, right? Those descending sort of broken chords. Yeah, this is much more uh, intricate. Than it has Spike that kind Extreme of, um, and it has a melancholy to it. Spite Extreme Wing is never melancholy <laughs> ever, right? It's um, so sometimes it's like gritting your teeth and charging over the trenches. Sometimes it's like throwing yeah. thunderbolts yeah, down really on your aren't. foes. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes it's like you know riding your motorcycle. It's, like it's perpetually you know, triumphant. Jumping, though. yeah. <laughs> riding your motorcycle down a Roman aqueduct and then leaping the gap in it. You know, as a right while you're sort of you know while you're while you're you, you know holding your <laughs> holding your loop in one hand and firing your machine gun from the other. Um, but uh, uh, but it's but like this this is sort of there's a meditative <laughs> and, spir- and in a different way spiritual yeah this is cool wizard music right it's it's sort of spite extreme wing is like a warrior who is tapped into the spiritual beyond this is yeah wizard I music. mean it, it, there's a this sense is sort like... of spiritual adventurer music does that make sense. Oh yeah, this is definitely this like this band never, never really channels. They're channeling the essence of Spike Extreme Wing, but they are never channeling them at their. And it's most yeah, it's really just, developing certain strains uh, within uh, it, just and really doing something new within a tradition. Obtuse, you know? That is, you know, because this is a quote unquote minor tradition, right? Not that many people have done work with it, so there's all this potential in the origin of the tradition. All this is potential locked up in Spite Extreme Wing and some of the other Invita Armada bands or whatever. And Laetitia is like, we're a, we could be a top quality band, right? A top shelf band. We can do new original work in this tradition. I think that's great. And it, with that riff, it's like, yeah, g- you know, God, that's pretty, right? It has this, it has this oceanic quality to it, right? Spite Extreme Wing is all solar and lightning. This is like they're feminine. Well, yeah, and I, I here, think that's cool. Ma- yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I really I appreciate what this mm. band does, and I think the only thing that they're missing to become massively noticed and to become t- top quality is to bring out some riffs like. Oh. One of the things we considered as a sample, the opening of uh, 
Aqua Fonte de Gloria off of Magnificat. Something they truly have one of those at the end of Gods and Explosive and the of Dry 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 has like a riff that some of these prog elements. You know, right maybe not like you know? an A plus Spite Extreme Wing riff, but is more complex. Well, actually, it does sound a lot like the stuff on Magnificat. It's like, it, it would be like an A Spite Extreme Wing riff on Magnificat. It's glorious. Um, it's. But it's a climax riff, right? Whereas, like Aqua de Fonde de Gloria, you need yeah, I yeah, just some they need something a little bit distinctive. I I, I feel right. like yeah, but because the oh, riff I'm thinking of mm-hmm. is not the intro riff, but when there's that break and the little tap tap on the snare before the blast erupts, you know, just is that, that like very dr- simple dr- dr- but incredibly dr- powerful. No fucking tremolo riff we we need we need would that. you want to just play it now i mean yeah. we love no, it's, it. it's the it's the da 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 you know that yeah okay i will just play it for me uh, uh. Spite Extreme Wing simply is the best black metal band. It's certainly one of my all-time favorites, you know, like top three. There's a... There's a... There's a serious oh, there is argument. Good. Yeah, no, that's what I'll that say. It's like, are sure, you have to. There's also a difference between what you love and what the best the is, classics. right? Which might be fine-grained. And so, like, you know... B- and, yeah, 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 no, and yeah. I think probably just. But they, I, I, th- I think we can safely say there's a the best original, Italian black uh, or band. almost as original as a lot of the Norse and Swedish bands. Um, it's uh, or the Slavs who have become kind of like canonical in their own way, right? This is, this, yeah, yeah, it's just awesome. So yeah, I mean, I think as far as uh, Letitia and Holocaust, we love what you're doing, and if we had any sort of suggestion for you, which you can take or leave, it would be like. Make your drummer is fantastic. Make him do more of that, <laughs> right? <laughs> Just, in, <laughs> yeah. Fuck this. No. Yeah, just, 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 fuck his shit up. Yeah, no, no, Tell you him gotta, he, he's got, you gotta, and you gotta get drunk. Listen, you bitch, play, you're right? gonna so blast at two eighty four. You're out of the band. Say you know? that. <laughs> um, no, they say they say. Yeah, they've, like they've got that like the oh, influence. Uh, I you know, sucked down too much Grazzi, and um, now I have to record. Uh, they, um, my God, what a glorious band! But like, so you like Tisha and Holocaust can do it. What they need, <laughs> they've got all the smart, and they've got a smart that adds a real new dimension to this music. They need more stupid. The stupidest riff they've ever had was on Fauci Truff. Yeah, no, that's that's, that's very they, true. They that's might cool need to riff, and then they just rock just, out an ascending minor chord progression with power chords, just like da 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 or something. It's just like, yeah, I love Swedish black. Music. Yeah, fuck it, go um, for it. It's Well, yeah, I think. Well, I think the I think the issue is when you're when you're this invested into. I think the issue here is they're invested into making every riff and every passage this very, very intricate, very interesting thing. When there's, yeah, I, I some, feel some like more body is good to develop the body yeah, of good the music. Ver- you might need to have some stuff that's a little more conventional good versions to of conventional create that like contrast. Those chords in that yeah. extreme one song, right? Those aren't like that's. There, you can hear Dawn or Sacramento playing something like that, but the, 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 the intervals are totally different, and it sounds Italian, not Scandinavian, right? 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and there's and also there's there's just a a brazen simplicity to it. Oh. You know, just this like we're going to we're committing yeah, to it's this like a very thing. simple yeah. melodic yeah, exactly. idea I mean, played very so yeah, high on the fretboard and right? we're Spider going Streamling in. is punk as yeah. fuck. They have a Misfits cover. The guy used to wear a devil lock. Um, you know, uh, they looked cool as shit back in the day. They looked like punk vampire accounts, you know, uh, (laughs) yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, it's, um, yeah. So this, (laughs) which is always great. We would, you know, at some point we'd probably love to have them on the show. Uh, we, if, you know, if they want to talk with some fucking Americans, um, and, uh, you know, definitely somebody that we want to follow and support going forward. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> that, you want to wrap it? No, yeah, I don't, don't, yeah, don't get no, me wrong. I think this it makes is sense. A, I think you need very to quibble record back a little bit it and figure I just, out. I've got very high this expectations is a, This, this, is a, this, this record has this kind of protean sort of exploring kind of quality. And now we need now this band needs to make it coalesce, right? You know, just to close the fist. Alright. Yeah. On that note. <laughs> yeah, close the fist and strike. All right. So, um, yeah, this is a good place to end it. Uh, so, uh, I know a lot of you fuckers are listening to this, uh, this podcast for the first time off the last one. Thank you so much for listening. And if you're enjoying it, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We're on, yeah, we're on subscribe Pod to our Podcast shit. We're, on we're not on Spotify. Stitcher we're on Apple Podcasts. On we're on all the big um, aggregators and everything. I, I don't know. Somebody just told me. Yeah. I, people talk about it. It's, uh, um, and what we're on YouTube. Stitcher? We've got a pretty good YouTube okay. presence now. Um, and <laughs> please, right. if you want to engage, you know, comment on YouTube, right? We, we currently have you know, or we're, we're, we're a new channel. If you comment on YouTube, I will yeah. reply to your comment. Comment on YouTube. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no. Yeah, there was one guy who left like We'll probably shout you out on the next the, episode. The you know, video we'll probably. And, uh, he, we, yeah, DJ DJ. I mean, if you're. If probably you're... like this episode too, but um, yeah. Yeah. All, All right. right. Yeah. <laughs> probably. <laughs> But yeah, so if you guys are invested, mm-hmm. if you guys like yeah, this even shit, if you, please give even us if whatever you don't support, like, uh, whatever like click YouTube of the mouse whatever, gives us more kudos so, on the various yeah, algorithms. Like, uh, yeah. Why not? Right? Exactly. Yeah. All right. Uh, Just sub anyway. It's good for oh, us. Oh yeah, yeah. We'll have. Yeah, well, yeah, no, and we'll, uh, yeah. Eventually, eventually we'll do a, a patch nice, giveaway yeah. or something. Yeah. We've got a logo <laughs> in the pipes. <laughs> logo coming soon. Um. Yeah, all right, cool. Have a good week, Yeah, we'll dudes. do a little patches or something. Peace. All right. Take it easy, guys. Peace.